Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody here to the University of Texas at Austin, the uh, recently dethawed and partially electrified Austin, Texas. Um, we have an amazing panel today, uh, put together by my uh, our good friend Paul Rogie. Uh, Paul is a uh, one of the uh, I guess titans, if you will, of the Texas uh, finance ecosystem. Uh, started and went to here to UT. Uh, started at AIM Management in Houston. Took their uh, financial started their financial uh, or, sorry international uh, money management group. Took it from zero to 14 billion over a couple of years, and after he left, it went to 38 billion and moved from Houston to Austin. Um, and just a word about AIM. AIM is an incredible firm. Uh, the number one uh, mutual fund complex in the 1990s. Uh, and the, the legacy of that is this room that's named for Gary Crum, which was Paul's boss, who was CIO at AIM. And of the three gentlemen, Bob Graham, uh, Gary Crum, and uh, Ted Bauer, Ted also, uh, they were the three managing partners, uh, top partners at AIM. Uh, Ted also named the, the business school at the University of Houston with a rather, rather large endowment. Uh, so as uh, we're fond of saying here in Texas, this is the second largest economy in America, the ninth largest economy in the world and we're working on building out our financial ecosystem. So this is part and parcel of that, and we appreciate y'all being here. So I'd like to ask Paul to come up and uh, introduce the rest of our panel today. I'll be moderating today. I'm Brent Adams uh, from Texas A&M, and my colleague Clemens Siam uh, from UT will be your moderators. Great. Thank you very much. Is this mic on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Great, great. Uh, once again, thanks very much to the Macomb School and Civitas and, and Real Asset News for sponsoring this event. And thank you all for showing up <clears throat> to our first symposium on inflation. I think this is actually the most important question facing investors right now. What's the path of inflation or deflation? What's the path of interest rates, the cost of debt, the cost of equities? And <clears throat> frankly, Harry Truman famously asked all of his advisors to please only send one-armed economists into the White House, uh, because he was very tired of economists saying, well, on, on one hand, this, but on the other hand, that. He wanted this or that, but not both. And I think all of us here assembled today are one-armed economists. After all, the common denominator between all of us is some time on Wall Street. And frankly, on Wall Street, you have to become one-armed. You, know, you have to either buy, sell, or hold at the end of the day, and you have to give a definitive opinion. So I think that you'll hear quite definitive opinions today. Uh, everyone here also has a different viewpoint. I mean, we come from fixed income markets, equity markets. I ran global and non-US investing here in the US. So that kind of different viewpoint will give you, uh, I think, an ability to triangulate on this issue of inflation quite well. You know, starting off with Julia, her time at the Federal Reserve, her experience at BNP, and then she's also on the faculty here at University of Texas. You know, myself, I was one of the 30 partners of AIM. Uh, I started their international group. And so I'm used to looking at really more global issues than U.S. issues. You know, and Lacey is legendary, frankly, <laughs> you know, with this time from the Fed and, and, and working with uh, economics and markets together again. And Doug, you know, Doug's been a friend of mine for over 30 years. We met when I was back at AIM. Uh, he was great experience as a strategist at Merrill Lynch and J.P. Morgan and Credit Suisse and then most recently was on the faculty at, at UMass Amherst. So I, I hope we uh, provide uh, a, not a disappointing program for you folks. Um, what I think is actually valuable today is you get access to this very experienced group of investors. We aren't trying to sell you anything also. We're just trying to affect and express our opinions. And I think that's unique, because so many people now are trying to sell you something. We're here because we want to. I've been retired for 10 years. Uh, and I, once again, just thank you very much for being here. I think hand it over to Julie. Julie. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yes, thank you. Yeah. This panel, um, I'm going to uh, give you an economist's perspective. Um, and but I, you know, as Paul noted, I also have spent a lot of time, more than 15 years, in the financial industry. Uh, so I'm used to having to have an opinion and defend it and then change it as circumstances change. So I'm going to tell you a lot about what we don't know about inflation. Um, so what have we learned? Where are we going? 
Uh, so I'm going to run through the basic macro theories of inflation fairly quickly. We've got a number of theories of inflation. Uh, monetarism is a school of thought uh, that uh, you might be familiar with. Um, and, you know, the, the classic quote uh, from Milton Friedman is, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon in the sense that it can be it is and can be produced only by a more rapid increase in the quantity of money than output. And that's a nice, simple framework. That's probably fairly a necessary condition for inflation, but it's not a sufficient condition for inflation, as it turns out. So one problem is we don't really know how to, what is money and how we use money changes over time, so measuring money growth isn't that easy. Uh, so we've got M2, which is basically all the deposits in the banking system, uh, and the, the growth of M2 is, is plotted here. That's the blue line against uh, inflation, against consumer price inflation. But one of the things that monetarism sort of assumes in its theory is that the velocity of money is um, constant. But in fact, the vo velocity of money isn't constant. The, the, the way that we process and leverage and move money around, the rate at which we do that, changes. Changes with the business cycle, changes with the demographics of a country, changes with uh, growth potential. So our, the degree of risk aversion in the banking system or amongst consumers or amongst the business sector determines the velocity. The velocity of money I've got plotted against uh, uh, right there on the right-hand side. Uh, and you can see that, that velocity has fallen pretty um, significantly in the last couple of decades. Uh, ticked up a bit, a bit recently. Uh, but so you can see that monetarism as a pure theory, um, one, it's hard to measure, and two, it really, hasn't really borne out in practice as a very reliable predictor of inflation in terms of just f following money growth. In fact, when I went to the Fed, I got my PhD here in the late 90s, went to work for the Federal Reserve Board, and they were just in the process of sort of phasing out some of their measurement of, of money growth because it's just not that useful, and so why are we spending all these resources on it? So the other theory, there's fiscal, the fiscal uh, theory of the price level, that government uh, borrowing is going to, you know, this is often what we get taught in sort of intermediate macro classes, the government borrowing, um, it competes with private sector for savings. Uh, so if the government borrows more, that's going to you know, crowd out uh, private investment. And the way it crowds it out is through higher interest rates. The price of money goes up. Uh, it's generally uh, thought that that will uh, cause inflation. But of course, we've got one big glaring contradiction to the fiscal theory, and that's Japan. Uh, that Japan has lots and lots of government borrowing and government debt. Uh, that's uh, shown in the left-hand side chart there, and yet the lowest inflation rate in the world, in the, in the advanced world. So um, re we, that really hasn't borne out in terms of government borrowing leading to higher inflation. Um, then the new Keynesian framework that is uh, also very common, I would say probably the standard framework at the Federal Reserve, system is, uh, is all about sort of the capacity of the economy. Uh, if, you're, if you are using up all your resources and still trying to stimulate the economy, that's going to be inflationary. So there's a, the economy has a certain growth potential. Uh, there's a certain natural rate of unemployment, if you will. If you've hired all the workers and you're still trying to sti you know, grow the economy, there's no more workers available, and so you're going to have to bid them away from each other through higher wages. That's going to lead to higher prices. That's going to lead to inflation. So again, that's a nice intuitive uh, uh, relationship. And so this chart here plots output gaps, uh, which is estimated by the Congressional Budget Office, and it plots it against inflation. So if the blue line is above zero, then we're growing beyond our capacity. That should be inflationary. If the blue line is below zero, then we're growing below our capacity, and that should be disinflationary. And there's a relationship there, for sure. There is some, you know, there's a relationship there. Uh, it's not very um, reliable, or it, and it seems to evolve over time. So um, one thing uh, that we say is there, you know, if we look at the most recent decades, 
we had these ebbs and flows in the output gap. We'd have recessions and then recoveries, and yet inflation was kind of immune to those ebbs and flows in the economy. It was pretty steady and stable. Uh, and so we, we, we described that as the Phillips curve has flattened. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that it's the economy, inflation just isn't as responsive to uh, resource utilization. Um, for whatever reasons, the Federal Reserve likes to think it's because their inflation targeting is so credible. Uh, but then, lo and behold, we got what we're in the middle of right now, which is a huge spike in inflation. But we, we initially got that when the unemployment rate was still very high and the economy was still had, was far from recovering from the pandemic. So what the heck, right? We, that does not fit with our um, theory and all of the uh, 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 Fed's credibility going into this didn't save us from that spike in inflation. So the other thing that the Fed uh, puts a lot of weight on is, is behavioral drivers of inflation, inflation expectations. So essentially, if you want to get inflation low and stable to the point where people just don't even think about it anymore, that you make your decisions about you know, what to uh, invest in or what to do with your life, not based on inflation, but based on real drivers, uh, real decisions. And so what you want is to get inflation off people's radar screen. Uh, there's a new word now of, called uh, a term irrational, inat irrational inattentiveness, that you want people to quite rationally not even think about inflation, businesses and consumers. And we've got some actually some top researchers in the econ department here that are looking at that. So these are three main measures that the Federal Reserve tracks. Um, one of them, so again, just like with money, it's hard to measure expectations. Whose expectations matter? How do we measure them? So we do some crazy things, like we call up consumers and we say, what do you think inflation is going to be over the next five to ten years? And they say all kinds of wacky things, and we say, okay, well, um, inflation over the last ten years has been three percent. Do you want to revise your answer? And then sometimes they, re then they revise them and give more sensible answers, and uh, so we're kind of coaching them. Uh, that's the University of Michigan expected inflation rate over the next five years. Uh, you can see that is um, the green line there. Uh, the professional forecasters, people like me, are in this line. So that's the dark blue line. And then um, the, in the um, financial markets, the Treasury Department issues inflation indexed securities. And so one thing that we track is what is the inflation compensation? What implied inflation rate is embedded in the price of those securities. Uh, so this is the Fed's preferred measure. It's taking the five-year to 10-year horizon. So we call that five-year, five-year forward. So between five years from now and 10 years from now, so not right now, not this year's inflation or this year's oil prices, somewhere long down the horizon, what do you expect inflation to be and what kind of compensation for inflation are you demanding in the markets. So um, this is, you know, again, uh, we've seen these move all over the place. The market measures are very volatile. The survey, the pro 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 professional forecasters is very stable. Consumers kind of go in between. But again, what we saw going into this cycle before the pandemic hit, we saw all of these measures trend lower. So there was inflation expectations were falling. Uh, inflation was very low and stable, and in from investors to uh, firms to forecasters to consumers, we're all expecting lower and lower inflation. In fact, the Fed was worried about this because they don't want inflation to be zero. They want a certain nominal cushion. Uh, and, uh, and, and yet, again, that low inflation expectation did not save us from this spike in inflation that we've seen. So something else caused the inflation that we've seen, and it wasn't, it wasn't, didn't start with expectations. It didn't start with an output gap. Money growth, yeah, that was there. Fiscal, yes, that was there. So those of the, the macro drivers that I've discussed, we've have like maybe half of them could help us understand the inflation we've seen. Some of the others, not so much. So um, the composition of inflation has also changed over time. And this, to me, is very, very important. Uh, this helps me understand 
some of the drivers of inflation kind of above and beyond those simple macro theories that I just outlined. Look in the 70s. So this left-hand side chart shows you goods price inflation, services price inflation, and, and overall inflation. So um, goods, with goods and services, I'm taking out food and energy. We often take out food and energy to get an underlying inflation because they're just so volatile. Uh, that's called core inflation. So this is core goods, core services, and then total inflation, including uh, food and energy. And what you can see is that in the 60s and 70s, everything was moving in lockstep. M inflation was truly a macroeconomic development. It moved together. It, you know, all prices sort of uh, uh, went up and down together. Um, and then that started breaking apart. Uh, it started breaking apart in the 90s. Um, and Mostly what was happening was that goods inflation was disconnecting from services inflation. Goods inflation was starting to drift lower. What was going on? Globalization, right? Globalization meant global markets, global labor force, it meant ever cheaper goods. Uh, and uh, I mean, for most of this period, uh, goods prices have been flat or falling. Uh, so there's another thing in, that's going on here, and that's technology. So technology does two things. Technology means just productivity-wise, we can do more with less. Um, and so that uh, tends to uh, make, especially uh, in the past, goods production was most impacted by this. It also allows consumers to comparison shop very easily. Uh, so it makes, makes consumers have a little bit stronger hand in bargaining, uh, and it has reduced consume, firm uh, pricing power. Uh, and, then, uh, and, and then it also does, we, we quality adjust some prices. I'm not going to get into the weeds of that, but that technology often means that we're quality adjusting, like the car you buy now has more bells and whistles, so if the effective price is uh, not as high because you're getting more for your money. Um, so that's, uh, uh, so, so compositionally, we can see a lot of big forces that have acted on inflation that don't have to do with sort of the macro environment. Globalization, technology have really disrupted goods inflation uh, and, and hence overall inflation and made it lower and, and more stable. Then the other thing that we've seen, and this is shown on the right-hand side, up until recently, we've seen a really stark trade-off where asset price inflation, which was lower and more stable in the past, uh, uh, and consumer inflation was higher and more volatile, they switched. So asset price inflation became much higher. We started getting booms and busts in the stock market, booms and busts in house prices, way more than we used to. Uh, I, I measure this by looking at household net worth, uh, which is the green line. Household net worth, so that's your net worth is your stock prices or your home prices. Uh, and uh, you can see that the, uh, as a percent of your income. So relative to your income, asset prices used to fluctuate a lot less. And then we got into the 90s. Again, in the 90s, we started, we had the, the tech bubble, the first tech bubble. <laughs> And then we, it, it burst, and then we had the housing bubble, and then that burst. Uh, and then uh, now what do we have? The everything bubble, uh, so, um, and, and we're a little bit bursting right now. So, um, so there's been this trade-off, although this cycle we got both. We got both consumer price inflation and asset inflation uh, during the, the pandemic. Uh, so, um, again, another thing that I have put into my toolkit, uh, I know there are some other sympathetic people, uh, is demographics. Uh, and this also ties back to the velocity of money. An older population just tends to be uh, more price sensitive. Older people don't like inflation, and so their uh, elected representatives do a lot to lower inflation for them. Uh, and, uh, and the economy just is less dynamic, and so you get less inflation the older the workforce is. Now, there's a, there's a lot of um, competing explanations for how demographics might influence inflation. 
you know, right now we're getting a lot of wage inflation because the populate the labor force isn't growing. So could you actually could it be inflationary a slower population growth? Um, but these are uh, so far the evidence is that globally speaking, if we look around the world at the slowest population growth or the shrinking populations, like in Japan, Europe, it tends to be associated with lower inflation, not higher inflation over time. So that's an empirical observation, not necessarily a, a law of nature. Okay, so drivers of inflation, we've got macro drivers, the state of the economy, where we are relative to our resources, um, monetary and fiscal policy, and then inflation psychology. And then these other factors that are sort of structural in nature, they, but they develop over time, globalization, demographics, technology. I'm going to throw a third one in there, which is where we are right now, the supply side functioning. Shocks to supply side functioning uh, can uh, uh, make the economy less able to um, deliver, produce and deliver goods and services and, and at least cause some temporary, temporary inflation. Productivity more generally is something that influences inflation. If we can create uh, the same goods at, at lower cost, then we don't have to, then that's disinflationary, right? We don't have to keep raising our prices if I can do more with less. So we've seen a lot of efforts at that. Uh, um, with, uh, through the pandemic, and I think uh, we're going to see a lot of that this year. I think we're already starting to see it. The uh, money velocity, credit multiplier, um, and at the end of the day, institutional credibility. Uh, so money is uh, the function of the monetary authorities of a country, uh, and ultimately your desire, your your to hold that money and use it as a medium of exchange, as a store of value, relies on your trust in an institution, in the institutional framework managing that money. And there's, that's kind of non-linear. Uh, if you think about the countries that enjoy reserve currency status, like the United States, like Europe, like Japan, like Canada, Australia, these are uh, countries that people are willing to hold their currencies uh, not just their domestic population to, you know, move around their own country, but people outside are willing to hold assets valued in those currencies because they believe in the stability, they believe in the institutional framework. And it's nonlinear because, you know, when you, and, and Paul will certainly be, be sympathetic to this, you know, if you're an emerging market and you've got a relatively new market economy, you've got an unstable institutional framework, your trade-offs are much worse. Like, you can't do a lot of fiscal stimulus if you're in a crisis without people really pulling back and losing trust in your currency. Whereas an advanced economy like the US, we could do gargantuan fiscal stimulus and the dollar has never been stronger, right? So institutional credibility and stability is a benchmark, an incredibly important benchmark to giving you better inflation trade-offs. Um, so a couple of views here, um, and I'll, maybe I'll skip view one. The, the 70s, that's a whole story. Um, I don't think it's mostly uh, the simple story of the Fed failing to control inflation and you know, output gaps. And uh, I, I think that the, the decline, the, the end of Bretton Woods was a pretty significant development that led to the OPEC oil shocks that contributed to the inflation. It was a gigantic devaluation of the dollar uh, and an institutional change in the global system that left some scars and took us a while to correct out of. Um, but that, if you take my class, you can, we'll talk about that. Uh, <laughs> view number two, so how do I understand the inflation that we're in right now and that we're coming out of? It's a combination of factors. So the massive monetary and fiscal support, it was very intentional to, you know, uh, go big, go early, was the mantra. And um, why was that the mantra? The mantra was that because we did too little too late in the last cycle, and we had the worst labor market in generations for a decade, and that was considered a failure. Sure, we had low inflation, but we also had an underemployed generation in millennials, and that sucks, and we can do better than that. 
So uh, that was one decision. But it did mean that it happened at a time that we were all locked down, right? So you were given a ton of money, but you couldn't go out, you couldn't go you know, to a football game, you couldn't go take a trip to you know, Hawaii. You had, to, you had to sit in your house. And so what did you do? You ordered goods online, right? That's what everybody did. They were given a bunch of money and they couldn't spend it on services and more than 60% of our money is spent on services. So we couldn't spend most of that. So you had to buy goods, and so people just bought a ton of goods. And at the same time that was happening, uh, that the COVID uh, outbreaks around the world, we were so globalized that they were shutting down ports, they were shutting down chip factories from the outbreak of COVID. Uh, and so you had this surging demand and constrained supply, and consumers, well, I don't care if I have to pay more for my used car because I don't have anything else to spend money on and I want to take a road trip. So, you know, people were less price sensitive. So that, that price sensitivity fell by the wayside. So a whole bunch of special factors. You can just see this here in goods and services spending. This is just the level of real consumer spending on goods and services, so adjusted for inflation. You can see how services spending, the top green line, tanked. And that never happens. That's the opposite of what typically happens in a recession. Usually good spending goes down uh, and services spending is stable. Instead, we got this collapse in services spending and at the peak, good spending was 42% above pre-COVID levels and yet our supply, global supply chains were constrained. So that was bananas. That was just like mayhem in the global supply chain. That's what that right-hand side measure shows you is um, uh, you know, the uh, blue line there is an index that the New York Fed puts together on supply chain functioning. And you can see, so if that's zero, it's functioning fine. If it's below zero, we're like globalizing and getting efficiencies. And then if it's above zero, we've got frictions in the system. We were like standard deviations, uh, you know, at 1.4 standard deviations <laughs> above, you know, into friction territory. And now we're still, we're still not totally normalized. There's still sand in the gears of, of the global supply chains, but we're a lot better. And that I've, I've plotted that against core goods inflation. Well, looks kind of like a good relationship there, right? It's, it was a confluence of circumstances that, that just gave us an explosive uh, growth. And now what the, essentially what the Fed is trying to do is keep that from getting in your head you know, keep that from getting embedded into, okay, well, if things are more expensive, I'm gonna demand raises, and then that's gonna raise labor costs, and that's gonna get more embedded in the um, inflationary psychology of the economy. Uh, that's the fight they're fighting right now. Um, and the economy continues to defy our neat, simple macro conventions. So this shows you uh, three month, six month, and 12 month annualized consumer price inflation, we're doing pretty darn good lately. We've had a run of inflation data that have been excellent. Uh, Broad-based slowing in inflation. We've got a big decline in energy prices. Food inflation is still going, but it's slowed. The pace of it is slowed. And then goods inflation, again, goods inflation is now deflation. You're actually getting some declines in used car prices, some small declines in new car prices. After having gone up, a lot, right? Cars are still way more expensive than they were before the pandemic, but they're a little bit less so. Uh, and consumers are starting now that they can spend on services and on goods, they're now becoming more price sensitive. They want deals. We had the first promotional shopping, holiday shopping season that we've had in years. It was great if you're a shopper like I am, it was a really fun holiday shopping season because you could get some great deals. So we're making some great progress, and yet unemployment is still at, well, we just hit a new low today. We, had, we have 3.4% unemployment, which is the lowest since 1969. Uh, and, and yet inflation is coming down. Well, that's like couldn't be better news. Now, will that continue? That's not guaranteed, but that's like the, what, what, what we call the immaculate disinflation. Uh, that inflation is coming down as the supply side of the economy is healing and improving 
as consumers become more price sensitive and go back to their old ways, uh, and, 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 yes, money's being pulled out of the system. Interest rates are higher. Uh, the Fed is shrinking its balance sheet. It's doing quantitative tightening, not quantitative easing. So we are pulling back. The money supply growth is negative right now. We are sucking money out of the system, and that's disinflationary. It sort of ripples through asset prices uh, and the whole system. Uh, so uh, I think that I will stop there, actually, right? I think I've gone to my time, and so um, uh, some concluding overall thoughts. Um, inflation is the hardest thing to forecast. I'm a forecaster. I actually have... I like make money off of forecasting <laughs> because I have a firm, a consulting firm, where people pay for my forecast, believe it or not. And it's really hard. Inflation is the hardest thing to forecast because so many forces act on it. It's not simple. Uh, and, uh, and so, yes, the macro models are useful guides to thinking, but there's many different models, and they, the, the degree to which they matter depends on the circumstances. Um, psychology matters, technology, productivity, demographics. One of the things that I do think is happening is, again, productivity. The supply side of the economy is functioning better. Q4 productivity, though actually second half productivity was great. Um, uh, one sort of underlying point is, you know, people like to, uh, it, it, as an economist, especially in financial markets, there's lots of people bashing on um, the Fed and money creation and easy money policy. You don't get modern era growth without fiat money. You just don't. Uh, we went off the gold standard for a reason. We couldn't grow. We can't grow without velocity and money creation. But it comes with inherent trade-offs and dangers that need to be managed. Hence, we build these institutions, like independent central banks, uh, to, to control that. Um, and I personally uh, happily stayed on the optimistic side last year, even when the inflation was smacking us in the face that, you know, yes, the Fed ha can and has to and should tighten policy. Um, at the same time, they're going to get a big assist in the supply side of the func uh, economy functioning better. And that is coming to pass. And I do not have a recession in my forecast. Uh, and um, uh, I do think inflation is going to moderate to a pretty decent level by the end of the year. Uh, and that sort of like my, my uh, analogy right now for where we are is a little bit like mid-90s-ish, a little bit mid-90s-ish, where, you know, in uh, mid-90s, 94, 95, the Fed raised rates really fast, caused a lot of turbulence in financial markets <laughs> that we remember well. And... Um, uh, and then, and, and it slowed growth, and we were like, why are we going into a recession? And then we went into another phase of the expansion because productivity improved. So I personally think that the combination of work from home, which is productivity enhancing, not a drag, not for every firm, but it's opening up new labor markets, it's opening up new potential, and a tight labor market is forcing firms to invest in innovation and in business um, in basically productivity enhancing changes to their processes because they don't have the workers available, so you have to do more with less. And there's been, this is the first recession we've had without a recession in investment. People, firms have kept investing straight through, uh, they had to, to do the work from home. They had to invest in all the capacity, the software and the t equipment to do so. But now we've got that investment in place and it's starting to pay dividends. So I actually think we're going to get that assist from the supply side uh, and, um, uh, and, and that we'll have a couple more years at least in this expansion. So I will leave that there. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Julie. talked about the, the future projections, and in particular, given that you worked at the Fed, 
Uh, what is your view what the Fed is going to do next? Over time, mm. over the last year, it has increased interest rates quite uh, sharply. Right. This week, they only increased it by 25 basis points. Fitchwell expects one or two more such raises. Uh, what is your prediction about the policy of the Fed? Yeah, so you want to discuss in more detail the dual mandate, uh, if that right. is justified to have... Yeah, no, that's important. Absolutely. Uh, goals, uh, yeah, so last year was the year of the Fed sort of being, they had been wrong that inflation would just be transitory and go away on its own, and, and, and they were catch up, catching up. So they were rushing to catch up. We had four 75 basis point rate hikes, which uh, we haven't had since the 80s, uh, and, uh, and, and they caught up. Uh, they smacked the housing sector. That's All the interest-sensitive sectors are in contraction right now, which is a sign that, yes, policy is now in restrictive territory, now the question is, now we're in the next phase, which is, is a lot more like normal monetary policy, which is, okay, we think we're in the zone where we need to be, but the Fed does have a dual mandate. Low and stable prices is one of its mandates. Maximum employment is the other. So they're trying to thread that needle, do, deliver the soft landing. That's their job. They're mandated by Congress to do that. Uh, and so that's what they're trying to do. So now it's about, we still, they still have more work to do. This is Jay Powell's uh, uh, term. And so they, they have two more rate hikes penciled in in their baseline, or they did in December. That can change. And I think they'll deliver on that. Actually, at, especially after this morning's employment report, I think we will get at least two more rate hikes. And I think the economy can handle it. I do think so much... Um, stimulus was put in during the recovery that we came out of this with the fastest, strongest labor market recovery we've had since the 1960s. Um, now, that's a cautionary tale because the 60s was one of the sowings of the seeds of the 70s, and they want to, you know, uh, uh, avoid that. But now they can sort of feel their way to what is the right level of, of rates. Um, I think markets have gotten a little bit over-optimistic lately, and that's why you saw this big bond market reaction to the report today. It was kind of overdue. Like, you know, uh, there was this kind of, the immaculate disinflation was just going to be painless. Eh, probably not so painless, right? We're probably going to have to, you know, the more resilient is the economy, the higher the, the neutral rate can be. Um, so I think, I think that their baseline of two more rate hikes is, reasonable, probably risks to one more rather than one less. Um, that's kind of what we're expecting. We'll just start. <clears throat> Thank you, Julie. Um, yes, once again, I'm Paul Rogge, and I'm a graduate of both the BBA program here, <coughs> excuse me, and the MBA program. And after I graduated from the MBA program here, I was hired into AIM. Gary Crum, who built this auditorium, was my boss. And by the way, who here is an MBA student? If you can just show your hand. By the way, and for the record, when I graduated, you know how they publish a survey that says what the low salary was and what the high salary was for your class? I had the lowest salary. I, you know, I, I knew my number. I knew what I had put on that survey, and I, I could tell that was me. So if you're ever wondering, oh, who's that poor guy at the bottom? That was me. But... You know, after six months of working at AIM, I was promoted to being a portfolio manager and launched their first international fund. You know, and so my message kind of to you is to don't worry about your starting salary. Get involved with something you love doing, and uh, things will work out from there. So that's, that's kind of my two cents so much on your career planning, I guess. Um, today I'm taking a slightly different approach than the typical economic presentation. I'm going to present more like an investment case. I'm going to speak about how the current investment climate really kind of fits in with what I've kind of built as uh, my investment theory that's really guided me over the last 30 years. I'll start talking about the two major lessons I learned about investing here at the University of Texas. And then I'll talk about how that framework really helped guide me to be overweight in technology and emerging markets during the 1990s and 2000s, and why that same kind of framework of thinking is what's taking me into kind of the inflation camp now. Yes, I am a one-armed economist. I believe in inflation. So my first lesson, relative inflation is important. You know, most of the commentary you hear about inflation, people are talking about the absolute level of prices. You know, 
But at the University of Texas, I studied uh, relative inflation of raw materials. Raw materials are things like commodities, you know, versus finished goods. That might sound familiar. We both had the same professor, Walt Rostow. The price level of economic inputs versus outputs and what drives internal inflation was the key question for me. And this is a quote from Dr. Rostow. You know, he, he was really my mentor here, um, national security advisor to LBJ and Kennedy, a renowned US historian. Uh, he did a lot of work on relative inflation, not just the absolute level. And he researched when and why there are various raw material inflation periods in the US and how those movements were tied to industrialization across the US. When I combined what I learned here in the MBA program with what I learned at the economics department from Walt Rostow, it really helped me a lot in, in managing money around the globe. You know, if I could figure out where input costs were going, I could figure out where margins were going. And if I could figure out where margins were going, I could figure out where to invest. And that was really kind of my, my guiding light, so to speak. So if you look at what Walt did, you know, he traced out that relative movement and relative pre peaks in raw material prices as the U.S. industrialized. So he started back in 1789, I think, actually. And we trekked through a peak in raw material prices as far back as 1820. You know, uh, that's also coincided with profitability. You, know, you also then, we looked at the raw material price peak in 1868 at the end of the Civil War in the cotton industry. And it goes on and on, even up to 1981, when we had that oil peak. Um, that really set the stage for how I view the world. You know, uh, yeah. And so my first paper I wrote for Dr. Rostow way back in 1989, to completely date myself, so to speak, was about the cotton industry in the 1830s. That sounds kind of obscure to really be looking at that when you're thinking of what inflation is. That's a pure cycle of industrialization. You know, industrialization of textile production radically lowered the production cost of cloth. Prices of finished goods actually fell at that time period. Mass production techniques led to dramatic increases in the cost of, dramatic decreases, sorry, in the cost of uh, cotton textiles versus the old way of doing things, which is just one guy in a loom. And that kind of makes sense, I think, intuitive sense to you, that technology is a big driver in lowering the costs of those finished goods. And at the same time, other new technologies in the 1830s came out. That was when railroads were uh, rolled out. That's when canals started to connect the US. And that allowed us to have large increases in raw materials also produced because we opened up new lands, and new cotton areas came in. So you actually had this period of deflation, I think fairly similar to what we've seen over the past 30 years, which were driven by technology and new areas being opened up. Um, also, if you think about what I've just talked about and a little bit of what Julie talked about, you know, this is an instant that's kind of different from what you learn in your freshman economics class. Because oddly enough, in order for the supply of a good to go up, usually the price has to go up, right? That's what we're taught with supply and demand curves. But with technology, I would argue you get a, a downward sloping supply curve. As the number of goods increases, the price actually falls. And so it's a different kind of economics or a different way of looking at the same economics. Also, I think I have to add, too, that during that time period in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, you know, workers that were in those factories all of a sudden became the new consumers. And that, once again, added to more demand as people were making more money because it was incredibly more profitable to make cloth from a factory. Those factory workers then made money, brought that home, and they could buy their own goods. And so there's a circular quality to that, and that's, that's the Industrial Revolution in a nutshell, so to speak. So what drives this price movement? Technological improvements, um, you know, I touched on this briefly before, uh, and uh, I, I saw the new industrial efficiencies uh, in emerging markets and in China when I started at AIM, uh, and it was very similar to the cotton industry. And so then I really kind of concluded this was a new industrial revolution to get behind. Um, let's go to the next slide. And so what's interesting, too, is if you look back on financial markets, that same type of raw material inflation you can see being active in markets. What's striking to me is if you look at investment returns, these raw material cycles 
are clear in those red lines. That's the time period where you had relative raw material inflation. And this chart comes to us from Bank of America. When the line is rising, real assets, which are generally here, a combination of commodities and real estate, outperform financial assets, which is a 60-40 mix of equities and bonds. So when the line is rising, real assets are outperforming. When the line is falling, financial assets are outperforming. Well, you see the line has gone down dramatically since the 1981 peak in oil. We've had a historic relative outperformance of financial assets. But looking forward, with a view of what Rostow talked about, we're very likely, I think, headed to a period of raw material inflation. And that, I think, is a spark that could set off inflation across the entire economy. Um, yeah, let's go. Well, that kind of leads to the second major question, uh, or major thing I think I learned here at the University of Texas. And now, this sounds a bit strange, but there is potential energy in markets, and there's kinetic energy in markets. And I know it sounds a bit strange, and I think most of you are probably trying to remember your sixth grade science class going, what is potential energy and what's kinetic energy? Uh, I'll give you a quick refresher. You know, uh, I've learned to think of financial markets in these terms, potential and kinetic. Uh, equities, as an investment, must have valid fundamentals. There has to be potential energy for that idea to work out, for that process to work out. But they also need a catalyst to unlock that value. That's where tra it's transferred from potential to kinetic energy. There are plenty of cheap stocks out there. Throughout the 90s, many manufacturing cyclicals in the 90s were always cheap. And they remain cheap. They didn't have a catalyst because they're increasingly being beat up by Asian manufacturers. This concept is also applicable, especially in commodity markets. And when you think of commodities, the supply-demand bounce is quite different than equities. Uh, the price of a commodity is priced according to the last unit that is needed and required for an operation to happen. That's very different than equity markets. You know, equities can always be priced as a trade-off between different companies, between equities and bonds. It's a relative valuation argument for equities, but the price of a commodity is set by that last barrel of oil needed, by that last bushel of grain, which is actually required. There's no substitute for another commodity often. This is why commodity prices can be much more volatile than equity prices. If you also look at economics, you know, we had a little talk about how we printed a little bit of money over the past few years. I would argue this is potential energy in the market, in, in the economy. Uh, more recently, you've had this huge expansion of the monetary base in several other developed countries. When central banks move towards the printing of money, many investors expected immediate inflation. But as Julia pointed out, that didn't happen. We had this huge increase in, in, monetary pol in, in the monetary base and monetary aggregates, but as she pointed out, the velocity of the money fell. Much of the newly printed money was not loaned out. It was simply saved in excess reserves in the banking system and showed up as a reduction in money velocity. This is why we don't see such strong inflation right now. Velocity fell, the loaning of money in the banking system, the turnover of that money declined, and several things will cause, I think, the velocity of money to start ticking up. And that's where I think inflation really takes hold. Although we still have a business cycle, in fact, in the 60s and 70s, we still had a business cycle then. Um, and that will have an impact here, but I think the secular move towards inflation is put in place through the increase in velocity. So to kind of conclude that, that second thought, monetary conditions are a great potential for it, but it needs, is necessary to have kinetic energy to move and, and put that inflation in process. If you look back through a history of uh, inflation rates in the U.S., once again, those red arrows that I point out as times where you had raw material inflation, that's where central banks had a problem holding inflation steady. So if you look at that, the time period from 1933 to 48, yes, that was World War II as well, but you had a huge surge in raw material prices over finished goods. Also in the same time period that Rostow would point to, really going back to the early 60s until the peak in 81, that raw material wave up ripple through the economy. I think uh, global, uh, sorry, global demand is increasing. I, I don't think the central bank controls raw material prices. I think global raw material prices in effect.
banks going forward. Once again, showing how this shows up in financial markets, we've had this run in financial assets as that line has fallen, and I think we're set then for relatively high returns in investing in commodities and real assets. So where are we now? This is one of my favorite quotes. I'm actually from Nebraska. So I think anybody who knows me within oh, probably two seconds, you know I'm from Nebraska. Uh, Will Cather is probably the most famous Nebraska author. I've loved this quote. There are only two or three human stories, and they go on repeating themselves as fiercely as if they had never happened before. You know, financial markets are essentially a human story. You know, there is fundamentals, but there's also a human quality to it. And the vast majority of market actors now have never experienced inflation. I think this is a blind spot that will cause a surprise in financial markets. So, to put it in modern terms, here we go again. Over the past 40 years, since 1981, production efficiency increased dramatically through both globalization and technology. It was both the expansion of manufacturing into the emerging economies, as well as increases in the developed economies' production efficiency that drove that kind of Rostovian model, for want of a better word, since 1981 on. You know, this process, at first during the 1980s and 90s, produced deflation and disinflation. It spread economic development around the globe. It was producing more at a cheaper price, that downward sloping supply curve. But now looking forward, instead of the steady supply of even cheaper imports coming from developing economies, Cost structures are starting to rise, even in the emerging world. Developed economies are becoming the primary source of global demand, and now they supply the majority of GDP in the, US, in the world as well. So they're taking center stage. This rise of the global middle class consumer, I think, is the most important development I've seen in my career. The power of global inflation is going forward, I think chiefly because of the global consumer. And this is a new secular trend. To look at the global uh, middle class consumer, I don't know if any of you have ever seen or looked at these kind of statistics. There's many ways to calculate this, but generally it all kind of goes to the same point. From 2000 to 2020, over 20 years, the global middle class roughly tripled. And that's defined as a country that's developing where incomes go above $6,000 a year, or they have assets, in this case, this is a Credit Suisse, uh, study they did, assets between $10,000 and $100,000. You know, this is the point at which people become consumers because they've taken care of the basic needs they have of, of housing, shelter, basic clothing, and now they have an incremental extra dollar for maybe a motorcycle, or maybe they move from a motorcycle up to a, a car, or they move from a fire to a gas stove or a microwave. It's that demand for consumer goods and also the demand for, like, protein. You tend to have an extra chicken or so every week if you can afford it. That's that consumer spending. And that's where that incremental dollar goes. And so the growth of this consumer class, I, I think, is driving the global economy. Now, we've seen creation of $1.2 billion so far over the last 20 years. Pretty much if you look at this development statistics and you look at where economies are going, we're going to triple that number again, not in the next 20 years, but in the next 10 years. So we're talking about 3.6 billion consumers coming into activity, and 90% of them will be Asian. And that'll drive the bus on commodity prices. Let's look at a few commodities in more detail. You know, my, my favorite uh, kind of commodity complex is, is the grain market. Maybe that's my bias being from Nebraska. I grew up on a farm there. I always like to think corn prices should be good. <laughs> um, but as the world continues to develop, the demand for animal-based protein will increase dramatically. And where do you get animal-based protein? You get it by feeding grain to animals. So the demand for grain should go up dramatically. You know, and it will fall on the U.S. and Brazil to supply that grain. If you look at the average farm size in India or China, it's only about two acres. Yet a modern functioning farm here in the U.S. is 2,000. In Brazil, it's even larger than that. And the reason why you need larger farms is because that's where you can absorb technology. You can't use a GPS-guided tractor. You can't use 
precision planting on a two acre field in India or China, but you can't in the US. So the incremental production has to come from the US and Brazil. And that focused movement in demand from the emerging world, I think will cause grain prices to go much higher. Here's a history of uh, Chinese corn imports and exports. You know, if you've ever heard of the iron rice bowl in China, you know that they tried to keep their independence in food production really as a national security issue. This is, this is sacred to them, that they wanted to keep food production and independence throughout the Chinese economy. And they did, really, through the 90s. You look at that in the 90s, they're the second largest producer of corn on the planet, the Chinese. But now, all of a sudden, with the increased number of chickens and hogs and cattle that they are feeding, they're having to turn to us to import grain. And you see these same, same types of statistics rolling across India and across Asia as well. Well, looking at metals and industrial metals, the quality of ore is falling. Now, for many of the industrial metals, ore grades have been declining, in fact, for decades. For example, for copper, the average grade has declined over just the last 20 years from about 1% to one half of 1% today. And this means, when you think about how does this actually affect the production of copper, this means you have to crush twice as much rock just to get the same amount of copper. You know, furthermore, there hasn't been any new, real global major copper finds in the last several decades. And once found, it takes about 10 years to bring a major mine into production. So this is a huge problem for the plans of moving towards electric vehicles. Also with the further industrialization of the globe, copper wires, connectivity with electricity. I think the price of copper is going up. And this is true for other major industrial metals too. If you look at uh, iron ore, zinc, and lead, even gold, the ore content that we're finding in mines is hitting all-time lows. So the efficiency of that whole industry is having a problem. Looking once again at oil consumption, too. You know, yes, the U.S., I think it was almost 6% of vehicle sales in the U.S. last year were electric vehicles. But if you look at what's going on in the emerging world, China alone over the next 10 years is expected to grow its annual auto sector from 25 million units to 39 million units. You know, that's an increase of nearly 15 million vehicles per year over the next 10 years. And that's more than what we sell in the United States in any year. So over the next 10 years, they're going to put enough U.S. car manufacturing demand in place in just China alone, let alone what's going on in India, let alone what's going on in other countries. So China will add those cars, um, although the percentage of electric vehicles sold is going to increase. I'm not negative on electric vehicles. Still, the total number of petroleum-based cars are going to go up over the next 10 years, even as electric vehicles make up a higher percentage. The numbers are just too great. So does that bear out in commodity indexes? Now, to give you a little bit of background in commodities, this is the CRB index. Uh, this is an old uh, index that was put together, oh, I think, really back in the 1960s. And it's based on the weighting of that index is based on the liquidity of the underlying contracts that are traded in Chicago. So it's a, frankly, I think a deeply flawed index. My brother Scott, yes, we have such fun family discussions that we discuss raw material prices and commodity indexes for our Thanksgiving meals, things like that. <laughs> well, my brother Scott created a new index for tracking commodity prices. And I think it's a great important. Uh, he made an arithmetic average rather than almost a market cap index. So here you have, like for example, that big peak back in the early 2000s was when oil went to 150 bucks a barrel. And as the price of oil went up, it became a larger part of the index. So it became self-reinforcing. My brother, on the other hand, took it down to an arithmetic average. So every day he's resetting how much of that index is in that same commodity. And he also then threw out commodities like sugar, cocoa, coffee, and orange juice. Because those all those are important for your morning. <laughs> They're not really economic inputs that are then processed into something else. So trying to center on industrial metals, on energy, 
and on grains like soybeans and the soybean meal into a lot of the foods we eat uh, on our table. So the, the result looks quite different. This is the Real Asset News Commodity Arithmetic Index. And you can see here that I think it tells a much better story that makes more intuitive sense to anybody that's experienced some inflation over the past few years. Notice the breakout across the commodities in the post-COVID era. This, to me, looks like Rossell's raw material cycle coming to life. Um, this is a broader range of 22, not 19, commodities. This includes some commodities traded really only in China, like iron ore. So it is a global commodity index as well. This process you know, should take years to unfold as a global economy experiences this greatest consumer boom ever conceived of. And what does this mean for money management? Who here is working on the fund also? Here at University of Texas, yes. Uh, I, I really am very, very thankful to see people like my daughter, uh, Lauren, who's here. She's a first year MBA student and that fund being still part of what's life here at University of Texas. I was part of the initial discussions with Keith Brown and, and fund up, and it makes me very, very proud that that is still here. But what does this mean for the changing of how you learn how to manage money? You know, when I was here at UT, everybody talked about the foundation model, the 60-40 the split, 60% equities, 40% bonds. And as inflation was falling, you got great diversification that way because as you headed into a recession, equities would sell off, but interest rates would go down, and so bonds would rally. So that's why you had this kind of give and take throughout time. Unfortunately, I think that give and take and that diversification is no longer going to work because now if we head into a time not in falling prices but in rising prices, we're going to face more problems like we saw last year when both bond and equity markets sell off. So I kind of propose what I call a 30-30-30-10. That's 30% 30 equities and 30% bonds. So in 60% of your, your foundation or your pension assets, you'd still have exposure to financial assets, but you need that diversification quality, again, that you no longer have. And I think that 40%, or at least in this case 30%, if that was devoted to real assets, that gives you that trade-off then. That gives you the diversification, which should even out your your returns, lower your volatility, and increase your return over time. The reason why I stuck the 10 on is I do think that there's also room for volatility strategies, selling covered calls, market neutral strategies, too, that would have a low correlation to overall markets as well. So I guess to summarize, you know, for me, inflation is a global issue. Its roots are really in the industrialization, the development that we've seen over the past 20, 30 years. Um, raw material inflation, I think, is in fact, you can call it an echo of globalization. Uh, this action caused future inflation. In fact, this action that is causing the future inflation, I think, has already happened. It's really a continuation of Rostow's raw material cycle that I learned about here. So that kind of concludes my comments. Uh, any questions? The, the, uh, the, the way I kind of view it, if you'd ask, uh, you know, what do I think of markets here? I do think, obviously, in, in, in some aspects, sure, the economy is slowing, inflation rates are coming down. We still have a business cycle in effect. And we also have China abandoning the zero COVID policy. Once that rips through China, I think lights are back on. The biggest buyer and biggest incremental buyer of oil and copper and all of those raw materials I talked about. I think will be lights on and active again. If you look across European demand, hopefully a year from now we'll have some peace in Europe and we'll have some rebuilding to do in the Ukraine. Uh, that will also mean, I think, pent-up demand being brought forward too. So I think Goldilocks may be around for the first or second quarter of the U.S. 
and then probably raw materials start moving up in price again in the third and fourth quarter. If you look at my brother's commodity index, it is actually now the 50-day moving average has moved above the 100-day. We're getting a lot of repair in commodity prices, and yes, the price of oil has come down, but it really looks kind of basing and ready to move ahead from here. So that's, that's what I think. Maybe that is the needle to thread where we don't actually have a recession and yet inflation remains stubbornly high. So, okay. Anything? Absolutely. If markets don't uh, tighten, you know, if there, there isn't uh, enough of restraint on the economy through financial asset pricing, through interest rates, through equity valuations, through credit spreads, and then the Fed all else equal, if the economy continues to be resilient, will add another rate hike in. Because yes, they are worried about their credibility. They are worried about the second surge in inflation. Um, you know, Chair Powell pretty clearly said the risk is still doing too little, not doing too much. Uh, so I think that they're definitely inclined to do a little bit more rather than a little bit less. You know, markets are just, markets get in moods and the mood at the start of the year is very optimistic. And it's because we were pretty gloomy by, in the, you know, we kept counting the down to a recession. We're not anywhere close to a recession. Uh, and so now it's sort of this optimism, but that doesn't mean that profits aren't under pressure, that you know, there isn't some restraint being built into the system, and borrowing costs are a lot higher, so we will feel the effects over time, and so it's a matter of whether we feel those effects in the, you know, in the data, in the real economy, and then the Fed can stop, uh, which, I mean, Basically, bottom line, I still I just feel like markets have gotten a little too optimistic right now. Even though I believe we can avoid a recession, it's going to be a bumpy road for profitability and margins this year. You know, it's not it, mortgage rates that are twice what they were before implies ongoing you know con corrections and reallocations in commercial real estate and residential real estate. So it's not like it's the all clear, the Fed can lower rates and we can sail on. It's, it's, there's an adjustment that we're still very much in the middle. And I think, yes, the Fed will, if the market keeps being a little too easy, the Fed will do more rather than less. Okay, right. all see that. First of all, let me thank Paul and Civitas Institute for inviting me here. Great pleasure for me to have an opportunity to speak at the great University of Texas. I actually have three connections. First and most importantly, uh, my wife, my beloved wife, uh, was a graduate of the University of Texas in 1980. And uh, she's as proud as any horn there is, let me tell you that. Um, number two, um, my daughter uh, had a BA in both plan, plan two and linguistics. And she left here not only with those degrees, but a, full, a Fulbright fellowship, which she successfully completed, had a tremendous education. And finally, um, in 1941, Year before I was born, um, my father uh, was awarded a PhD in psychology 
uh, from UT. And um, thanks to Dad, uh, I was a behavioralist long before I took my first course in economics. So it's a great pleasure uh, for me to be here today. Uh, I also want to congratulate our first two speakers. Um, they did an excellent job of representing their viewpoint. Um, in both cases, I have reservations about it, but they did an outstanding <laughs> job. Um, I want to thank Julia because she um, introduced some of the important concepts that I'm going to take and run with. Um, you forced me to change my introduction, Julia, oh. which is very uncomfortable. <laughs> um, I was going to start off by um, telling you why I greatly admire Milton Friedman. He was truly an outstanding economist, uh, winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1976, uh, made seminal contributions to price theory and aggregate economics. Uh, his permanent income hypothesis greatly enhanced our understanding of the consumption function. Um, free to choose and capitalism and freedom are two superb uh, introductions to economics. And if you students haven't read them, then I, I strongly advise you to do so. And for all of those of you that are interested in having a better understanding of, of this field, um, essays in positive economics is a must. Um, the, the problem of, of Friedman's monetary economics is that he considered the velocity of money to be stable. As Julia showed, and I'm going to show you over a longer period. Too. We all have velocity. <laughs> but I'm going to show it to you back to 1910. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it, it's, not, it's not stable. No. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Friedman's basic model and I'm going to convert the velocity into an endogenous variable. And to do that, I have to explain to you what determines the velocity of money. And as far as I'm concerned, I've done that. And once, once you consider mo monetary growth and velocity separately, uh, you actually have restored the Federal Reserve to the capacity to, to once again take money into consideration. And, and that is really essential because I believe the pandemic response was a colossal mistake. It absolutely devastated the majority of our people. And the consequences that are, are very grave and, and they have to achieve stable prices if we're gonna have broad-based prosperity. Um, certainly there are those that can, particularly Paul and others, that can prosper in a highly inflationary environment, but count the rest of us out. It's just too, too difficult. Now, um, before I, I get into this, I have, where are my, where's my charts here? Can I get to my charts? What's happened? Okay, here we go. There's, there's my little tongue. First of all, I have to show you this, or I get into trouble. See, I'm in the investment, investment management business, not the mind-changing business. And uh, therefore, being regulated by the SEC, I have to make three declarations that everyone understands. And I hope you're reading this very carefully as I talk. Um, uh, first of all, um, uh, I am not here advertising my firm. Not advertising, number one. Number two, I am not soliciting business and number three, this is purely an educational exercise. Now, if we all understand that, um, I'll proceed to my discussion. Um, Friedman's um, theory of interest rates, uh, which was first published uh, in 1968, um, was found in the American Economic Review. It was his presidential address uh, to the AEA in that year. And um, 
That was 55 years ago. As a matter of fact, uh, my uh, thesis, uh, my dissertation advisor handed me the March 1968 AER when I went through my field exams. And after I had passed them, he said, I want you to take and read this article, and I want you to understand it so that you can explain it to me the next time I see you. Now, the reason I mention that is that, that economics is a science. We're, we're not, we're not, we don't have the accuracy of physics and chemistry. We're a social science. But we do have the capacity to test a hypothesis and to reach a conclusion as to whether or not the hypothesis is valid or not. And that's what I'm going to do today. My hypothesis is that we should simultaneously consider what's happening to money and velocity, and that when we look at it in this framework, we have reestablished a basis for the Federal Reserve to once again bring monetary analysis into their actions and hopefully prevent the disastrous results of the pandemic response. So what I'm going to do now is basically rewrite a Friedman's theory of interest rates. Now, I, I could have rewritten his theory of inflation, but it's, it's much longer. The theory of interest rates is very, very concise, and it only required a few words from me. Now, what Friedman is doing is he's working in the context of the equation of exchange. Remember that name, equation of exchange. That's what we're talking about, developed by Fisher, which says that nominal GDP equals money times velocity. Now, from this basic framework, Friedman says that there are three effects that cause the business, the, the, the interest rate cycle to move forward. And they are called the liquidity effect, the income effect, and the Fisher or price effect. And the Price-Fisher effect is also uh, named for Irving Fisher. Fisher gave us the equation of exchange and the Fisher equation, which are different. The Fisher equation says that long-term treasury yields, the risk-free long rate, is equal to the real rate plus inflationary expectations. So two of the great pillars of macroeconomics came from one man, Irving Fisher. Now, the liquidity effect, uh, any of you that took Econ 101 were taught the liquidity effect. Um, unfortunately, even though you were all taught it, it also requires modification because it ignored velocity just as Friedman did in constructing his other two effects. Okay, so here we go. Uh, let's see. Now, where is my pointer here? I think we just... We just it ran out of... Okay, well, I'll just tell you what it said. Okay, so basically what Friedman is saying, and you can read up here along with me. Here is the passage from Friedman's uh, 1968 article, along with my modification. The initial impact of increasing the quantity of money at a faster rate than it has been increasing is to make interest rates lower for a time than they otherwise would have been Here's my modification, provided the velocity of money does not surge ra rapidly. And then returning to Friedman, but this is only the beginning of the process, not the end. So there's the liquidity effect, Friedman's position rewritten, along with what should be in the textbooks as opposed to what we taught generations of students. Friedman then assumes that the rapid monetary growth will increase income and spending. And here is how I would rewrite it. Quote, rising income will raise the liquidity preference schedule and the demand for loans. It may also raise prices. My modification, unless the velocity of money falls sharply. With velocity stable, Friedman's income and liquidity effects serve to reduce the downward pressure on interest rates. But for me, the question of whether velocity is shifting is just as germane as whether money growth is accelerating or decelerating. And then that leads to the Fisher effect. 
let the higher rate of monetary growth unchecked by velocity produce rising prices, and let the public come to expect that prices will continue to rise, borrowers will then be then will, willing to pay, and lenders then will demand higher interest rates, as Irving Fisher pointed out long ago. That's all it took. I think that's less than 20 words. But what I have done is instead of include, uh, considering velocity as being not constant, but stable, but turning it into an endogenous variable. So here's what we have to do. We're going to look at money, and then we're going to look at velocity. But to start, I'm going to give you what I consider to be the best measure of money, and it's not M2. Now, this, is, this may be very presumptuous on me, but um, as Friedman and Mrs. Schwartz wrote in their book on monetary statistics, the definition of money has changed many, many times. It's in a constant state of evolution. I mean, one, at one point in time, on the islands of the Pacific, it was, it was stone characters that couldn't possibly be moved. And it's, and it's gone from a variety of coins to fiat money and so forth, and it's evolving further today. I believe the most appropriate measure of money at this point in time is something called ODL or other deposit liabilities, which is different from M2 because M2 includes currency and the money market mutual shares. Now, clearly, currency is a medium of exchange and store of value in a unit of account, but currency is falling away. More and more institutions are requiring something, are requiring credit cards. They, they don't want to take the risk of carrying around cash. And there's been a problem with currency for a long time. As the price level has gone up, it's been increasingly difficult to do large scale transactions in currency. It's just too bulky. And money market mutual funds never really met uh, the medium of exchange criterion. And it really wasn't the definition of money because when, when you go into the, your, your money market mutual fund and you ask for, for funds, they have to sell an asset to give you money. And, and so it's really a different kettle of fish. Um, and so let's look at, at my preferred definition versus M2. And I've, I've taken the, the uh, four quarter changes since 1952 and I've, I've converted them into real terms. And you'll notice that they move pretty well together. Uh, they, they do diverge at times. Notice what was happening there before the pandemic. And notice that money growth was decelerating very, very sharply. In, in fact, I believe we might have gone into a quasi-recession, a rolling recession, when, but the pandemic obliterated the whole thing. And in fact, so both measures were very, very close to a year-over-year -year growth rate of zero. And from that point, due to a coordinated monetary and fiscal operation, I, I have to emphasize that word coordinated. The Federal Reserve shouldn't do coordinated. They, they are supposed to be independent of uh, the, the federal government. We've had two major coordinated operations in my career. Once in the early 1970s, Richard Nixon was in the White House. Arthur Burns, his good friend, was chairman of the Federal Reserve. They cocked up a program to uh, devalue the dollar, accelerate fiscal policy. Burns, who was head of the FOMC, chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, agreed to be chairman of the interest and dividend control uh, component of wage and price controls, which was Nixon was uh, imposing at the same time. In other words, completely con com compromised the role of the Fed chairman. And as soon as this program of the early 1970s blew up in inflation, the fiscal policy partner left the room, and who was left there to try to clean it up? The pandemic response was coordinated. But when the program blew up, fiscal policy's gone. And the only one left to do anything about it was the Federal Reserve. And they, uh, in spite of saying that they are data dependent, know nothing about data dependency. 
They sat there and let the inflation rate accelerate to three times faster than their target before they took the first, the first action. So Friedman's basic point is that from the, there's my red dot, from the cyclical trough to the cyclical peak, that determines the degree to which monetary policy overstimulates the expansion. Now, of course, Friedman wasn't taking velocity into consideration, and, and I'm going to do that. Uh, velocity is still present. We're just going to look at them one at a time. And then Friedman said that from the cyclical peak to the cyclical trough determines the degree to which Federal Reserve policy destabilizes the economy when it goes into a downturn. And notice that the, the current rate of decline in ODL, which I consider preferable to M2, as well as M2, is at a record. Record rate of expansion, record rate of decline. The sorry history of the Federal Reserve. And let's just be blunt about it. They boom the booms, slump the slumps. And the majority of our people pay for the problem. All right, so there's the basic framework. The, the other advantage of looking at ODL as opposed to M2 is that the Fed quit publishing weekly M2 data. But I've outsmarted them. ODL can be taken off the H8, which is released weekly. So in fact, we, 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 we just received the December numbers for M2 in, in late January, but we already have half of, uh, Feb, of the January data for ODL. And in the first half of, of January, ODL is already about $100 billion below where it was in the month of December. In other words, we can track it uh, uh, more quickly, and, and I'm going to do that for you as we go forward here. So now let's look at the relationship between ODL velocity and the long treasury bond yields. And I'm doing it since 52. In just a minute, I'm going to do it, going to go back to 1910 using M2 and treasury bond yields. First of all, you can see over the longer time period that velocity was never really stable. Uh, it was 2.5 average, but we uh, reached as high as uh, approximately 3.7 there uh, in the late 1990s. There's a very good reason for that, which I'm going to explain. We hit a low in 2020, and we've turned up slightly. Uh, notice that the correlation is not perfect. The R square for just one variable is 84. But the reason they diverge is that velocity is not the only determinant. Money is having an influence. We have to consider both of them together. Let's look at the longer time period, which I think is extremely instructive. We're able to go back to 1910. Uh, here we have to use M2 because ODL cannot be constructed back this far. I'm working on it. Take some archival work. I may eventually get it. Uh, once again, we notice we're measuring velocity on the left-hand axis um, and the Treasury bond yields on the right-hand axis. Uh, the average is 1.69. We hardly ever stay at 1.69, except look at this time period right here from the 1950s to the early 1980s. In Friedman's defense, that's when he was doing his research. Friedman was an empiricist. And he reached the conclusion that velocity was stable because that's what the data said. Now, one of the things that I find very ironic and interesting here is that this data that we have back to 1910, which Friedman himself could not use until very late in his life, is that he created it painstakingly by going through reams and reams of stuff in musty old areas, not pulling it down from the internet. Uh, again, the, 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 they don't move in tandem, but notice that when velocity is high, the interest rates appear to be high. They weren't here. This deviation is because money monetary growth was very low. There was an upturn in velocity uh, in the last couple of years. But what, what I think is important is that notice the upturn in velocity is not nearly as large as is the rise in long-term rates. And to me, that's significant. 
And we'll get to that in just a minute. So there you have it. We have two variables to consider. Now that leads us to the next question, what determines velocity? Now the Federal Reserve doesn't know the answer to this because they ignore money. They haven't been doing any research in money, even though that's the variable that they are constitutionally assigned to be focused on. There are three elements that influence velocity. One are idiosyncratic factors. They work all the time. Um, uh, for example, if you get major swings in inventories from one quarter to the next, sometimes they're related to the cycle, sometimes they're not related to the cycle. This is particularly true for agricultural inventories. Um, last year, one of the reasons that economic growth did as well as it did, and it barely grew for the year, less than 1%, was because we had a big rebound in inventory. So if you get a rig, big rebound in inventories, which, which may be appropriate or inappropriate or what have you, gives G, GDP a little bit bigger lift. Uh, another one of the volatile idiosyncratic factors constantly moving around uh, is the net export deficit. And in the second half of last year, we had a tremendous improvement in the net export deficit. Well, if, if the net export deficit get le gets less negative, that boosts GDP. Ironically, it's more of a sign of economic weakness because the reason the trade sector was improving was because imports were going down because the consumer doesn't have any money to spend very much. In addition, our exports were faltering because the rest of the countries around the world are in much worse shape than we are. But nevertheless, you do get these idiosyncratic factors. And last year, they helped boost velocity. But these are the two variables that are important. These are the two fundamental determinants, in my view. The first is the marginal revenue product of debt. Now we're going to talk a little serious economics. To me, one of the most important concepts in economics is the production function. One of the reasons it's, 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 it's not just microeconomics or macroeconomics, it's economics. The production function on the individual level, the state level can be aggregated all the way up. You can't do that with demand curves. The micro demand curve cannot be aggregated. Production functions can be aggregated. They have four variables in them. Technology, interacting with the three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. From the production function, we get one of those basic economic concepts that we forget to use, law of diminishing returns. You remember it well. You took a course, you probably memorized it. But what, what we needed to do was we needed to make sure that our students understood the importance of what they were being taught. And here's, here's the way it works. If you begin to use a factor of production, initially GDP rises. In other words, if you start using debt capital, GDP goes up. In other words, there is a time for more debt. You continue to use that factor debt capital, GDP flattens out. In other words, you switch from a beneficial period to a neutral period. Doesn't mean it's positive, doesn't mean it's negative, it's just neutral. But then if you continue to overuse debt capital, you get diminishing returns. And we can see this in the data. So let's look at it. Notice what, what happens to the marginal revenue product of debt there from the 50s to the early 80s. Very stable. What was velocity? Just showed it to you earlier. Velocity was very stable. Beginning in the uh, late 1980s, the marginal revenue product of debt begins moving down from that 70 to 80 cent level. We're generating 70, 70 to 80 cents of GDP for of debt, but it falls rather steadily. We get a temporary rise last year. See the little rise there? What happened to velocity last year? 
turned up. In other words, overuse of debt capital is pulling the velocity of money downward. And the situation is much worse in all of the major other areas of the world than in the United States. So look at the US number. Right now, we're generating 37 cents. In Japan, less than 20 cents of every dollar of GDP for dollar of debt. Europe and China are somewhere in between. The Chinese data are so disreputable, I will not put them up there. The, the Brookings Institute, uh, Institute published an uh, outstanding paper a couple of years ago done by two US educated economists living uh, in Beijing, and their forensic analysis showed that the GDP statistics are overstated by about one fifth, and, and that the trend is apparently moving upward. So, but the, the numbers of debt productivity in China are even, even worse. Everyone's talking about the fact that China is reopening because the, the COVID restrictions have ended. And that may give us a one to two quarter pop. It does not change the fact that China is a highly inefficient economy. And by the way, one of the consequences of, of the weak production function, and you're gonna see this in just a bit, is that it's bringing the growth rate down and it's leading to a deterioration of demographics. In other words, there's a subsidiary effect that's filtering through to the broader economy. And as the growth rate falters under the weight of this massive debt overhang, we're getting less growth, and that is encouraging less births, less family formation. And I, for one, believe demographics are destiny. Another fundamental factor is the loan to deposit ratio at the banks. Notice it's a very cyclical variable. But it was too stable, also stable, for uh, much of the time period in here. But the thing to note about the loan to deposit ratio is that it's a lagging indicator. Look at the peak here in the great financial crisis. And look at the cyclical trough. That's about five years later. The average lead time between the cyclical peak and the LD ratio and its trough is 47 months. As we get into the second half of the year and as the downturn deepens, the loan to deposit ratio is gonna go lower. In other words, even though these two variables turned up last year, leading to a rise in velocity, which has delayed the Federal Reserve's tightening method moving through the economy, it's gonna reverse. But what isn't gonna reverse is money growth is gonna keep coming down. Because as Julia said, she agrees they're gonna tighten two more times. That's gonna take reserves out of the banking system. That's what consequence. In addition, they're liquidating $96 billion a month from their portfolio. And so the monetary deceleration in its underway is gonna get worse. And no one's concerned. Federal concerned because they're over influenced by the stock market. Stock market's doing fine, right, Julia? Not a problem. So the Fed is free to continue its policy of restraining economic activity. But what we've learned is that there is a considerable difference of time between when restraint occurs and before it hits the economy. Let's go to the next chart. Here's my equation. What I did is I related ODL velocity to a weighted average, and I lagged, I lagged the independent variables, the marginal revenue product of debt, and the commercial bank loan to deposit ratio. Left out the idiosyncratic factors because they can't be predicted. Here's my equation. Velocity in time period T is a function given half weight to MRP in period T minus one, and 0.5 to the loan to deposit ratio in LT. The reason I did that is that we've got some of the same variables on both the right and left side. I don't want to abjure uh, the degree of correlation because if I do that, if I have variables on both sides of the equation, then we don't know which way causality is running, but I avoided that by using lag variables. It also makes it much easier to predict 
at least for the next year forward. And notice the R square. Very strong relationship. During the period of stability, marginal revenue product of debt, loan to deposit, uh, cooperate, they turn down, and the big decline is explained. The question is, why did it fall on my shoulders to find this? Why didn't the Federal Reserve, the most expensive research operation in the world, 400 PhDs, not identify this basic relationship? It could be, I'll say it lightly, dereliction of duty. Next paragraph, next, next chart. Now, money in my model is not endogenous either, and not exogenous, it's, it's endogenous. And what I like to do is I like to look at, at what's happening to total reserves and the deposit multiplier. Now, uh, if you can look at line seven up here, maybe I hope you can read it. Um, the deposit multiplier for all of last year was just, un just under four. But in the fourth quarter, it surged to 5.3. When, when the Fed starts, started the balance sheet reduction, the banks are pretty savvy. And they find a way to circumvent the initial Federal Reserve tightening. It's one of the reasons why we see these lags. So the deposit multiplier rose in the fourth quarter, offsetting some of the reserve contraction. But look what's happened here in early January. We've come down from 5.3 to 5.1. I think that's important. It's a sign that the Federal Reserve restraint is getting control of the banking system. They don't have control of the stock market, but that doesn't matter to me because I consider the stock market a third-rate economic indicator. It's important if you're an investor, but in terms of its relevance to the economic activity, it's, in my view, not that great. Now, well, I know there's a so-called wealth effect, and theoretically it does exist, but when you try to find it, it doesn't, it's not observable, at least to me. Now let's look at what's happening to total reserves, which is column number four. So before the pandemic, total reserves were 1.7 trillion. In 2021, they went up to 4.2 trillion. The high water watermark was 4.3, and we're now down to 3.1. The Fed has, has now reversed about 40% of the increase in total reserves. The deceleration in ODL and M2 is not happening by the, some sort of fanciful occurrence. The Fed caused it. And in my personal view, the balance sheet reduction is contributing at least half and maybe more than half of this reduction which the Fed is now free to continue doing. So the markets go on their merry way, but the fact of the matter is beneath the surface, the Fed is developing a, a tighter and tighter control over the overall economy. All right, so a minute ago, I showed you the marginal revenue product of debt in the United States is declining. And I told you, that the marginal revenue product of debt is weaker, considerably weaker, in China, Japan, and in Europe. If my theory is right, that MRP is a major determinant of velocity, we should see this when we do a comparative analysis of velocity. And I'm doing it for uh, Japan and Europe versus the US. No, and I take 1998 because that's the first year in which we have comparable data for the entire EU. That's the year the EU came into existence statistically. There's the US, the green line. I have to revert to M2 here. So last year, M2 turned over 1.1 times. Paltry, remember, it got up to, to 2.808 peak. But look at Europe, 0.86. Money's not even turning over one time per year in Europe. And Japan is turning over less than one half time per year. So marginal revenue product comes down, drops in the US, drops more sharply in Europe and Japan because they even have greater debt overhangs than we do. Consistency of data. The theory is intact. Okay, now I want to talk about inflation. 
Uh, inflation swindles nearly everyone, but it swindles the modest and moderate income households the most. That's where the heavy burden falls. And here's the data. Um, what you're looking at here, the gray line, is the real um, full-time wage and salary workers' income. And the black line is for a subsample. The, 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 there we have 116 million full-time wage and salary workers. We have 77 million, which is the subsample. The subsample is available every month. Look at the last two years. 116 million people suffered a 3% decline in their standard of living for two consecutive years. Yeah. We took out $10 trillion of combined monetary and fiscal policy uh, stimulus. We got $2 trillion of GDP. And we clobbered 116 million people due to the high inflation. Not a good deal. Now, uh, we have 72 million retirees. And we don't have current data on how the retirees are doing. But historically, there's probably 60 million of our retirees who were hurt even worse than the 116 million working people. And that's normally the case. In other words, the, the pandemic response was very devastating to nearly 180 million of us. Inflation does not work for the majority of our people. OK, now let's look at a broader measure of, of income. This is real disposable per capita income. The red line is your trend rate of growth that was in place prior to the pandemic. We get these two big bulges. There you can see them. I wish I could put the cursor on them. Those are what we would call transitory income, advanced by the government. Now, there's a mistaken view that it doesn't matter if the government goes into debt if it helps the consumer, well, for the short term. But those transitory actions, which were so inflationary, don't change the permanent situation. But now notice what is happening. The real per capita GDP is falling substantially below the trend. And instead of being at $50,000 per capita or 40, uh, uh, just uh, that's about uh, 49,500, there we are at 45,400. By the way, it's a minor technical point, Julia did a great job, but I think the labor markets are actually deteriorating. This number today, notwithstanding, um, this number that we can't we received today is a very low low quality index, and it, 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 the, the sample size is very very small. Um, but we do know something about what happened in the second quarter. Now I know the second quarter was a long time ago, but we actually have something called the business dynamics which is based on the quarterly survey of employment and wages, the QCEW. The BED is seasonally adjusted. And in the second quarter, in the payroll number that was reported today, we were told that establishment employment was up a million. But the, the business dynamics, seasonally adjusted, from March to June shows a decline of 200,000. In other words, the most reliable data that we have indicates that the labor markets are, in fact, deteriorating. And there may also have been a seasonal adjustment problem. The overall unemployment rate, it did decline. That's correct, as Julia said. But we have broader measures. We have a U6 unemployment rate, and it actually ticked up a little bit, still at a low level. But if you look at the alternative survey, the household survey, full-time employment in January is 166,000 lower than it was in May. In other words, people are being forced to take part-time jobs. The labor markets look good on the facade, 
but they're deteriorating below, which means very, very likely that the per capita income is even weaker than the uh, published statistics, which are based upon the monthly payroll data. Another indication of how badly uh, impacted our households were uh, by the inflation. Uh, since 1929, the household saving rate is 4.2%. Last year, it was a little bit above 3%, which is where we were in the craziness leading into the great financial crisis. What consumers had to do, uh, food, fuel, uh, shelter, costs rose. Those are price inelastic goods. There are no good substitutes for them. The consumer had to pay the price, particularly our modest and moderate households. So what they did is they hit their credit cards, they drew down their balances, and as a consequence, they're in much worse shape. Everything seems to be hunky-dory with the stock market, but the distress in our consumer sector is intensifying, and I believe significantly so. And that's what happens in inflations. Let's go to page number 12. Um, supply side considerations, as Julia said, are very important. This is, in my view, the best measure. It's the length of uh, time between when you order and when you can expect to receive the goods. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, the, uh, this is a diffusion index for the overall economy in the manufacturing sector. Prior to the pandemic, it was around 54, went up to almost 80. But here we are at 45, which is where we were during the financial crisis. There are no more real significant supply chain disruptions. So what is inflation? Too, few, too much money, chasing too few goods, provided that velocity doesn't change the story, which means that the dynamic of inflation is changing and moving lower. Very critical chart here. And this, this ties in I believe to what I said previously. So the blue line is the trend rate of growth in real per capita GDP from 1870 through 1997. And prior to 1997, we were growing 2.2% in real per capita terms. But notice what's happened since the late 1990s. We've been falling further and further below. When the pandemic hit, where there was a $10,000, 500 gap between real per capita GDP and the trend line, and now it is $12,800. In other words, the gap is increasing. Since 1997, we were growing 1.4%. The historic average is 2.2. That's 0.8% per annum. How many of you in this room took um, uh, net compound interest. A lot of you? Certainly you did. Compound 0.8% for 25 years. Big, big difference. In 2011, Vincent Reinhardt, Carmen Reinhardt, and Ken Rogoff in a peer-reviewed uh, uh, publication of the American Economic Association found that when U.S. government, gross government debt exceeded 90% for five years, you will begin to lose one-third of growth against trend. What are we doing today? We're losing slightly more. The per capita gross GDP, uh, uh, gross government debt per, uh, to GDP is approaching 140. We have a serious debt overhang. It's pulling economic growth rate down. We took on $10 trillion worth of stimulus, got $2 trillion of GDP. The reason we're falling below trend is that there is no Keynesian multiplier. There was a multiplier years ago, but under diminishing returns at the time when debt is beneficial, we've long since passed that point. And the result is that our standard of living is falling uh, very precipitously. The insert up here is extremely important. The red line is real per capita U.S. dollars in 2010 terms versus uh, Europe. And the black line is versus Japan. Notice what's happened. 
we have steadily outpaced those more heavily indebted economies. Our real per capita income is now 38% higher than in Europe and 20% higher than in Japan. We have a debt overhang. It's undermining demographics. The deleterious effects in demographics are worse in Europe and Japan than in the United States. And basically, they, we have no engine of growth. And as I said to you earlier, don't count on China. OK, here's my conclusion. Uh, and I'm going to um, raise this issue because uh, one of the questions that comes up is, uh, how would Friedman feel about someone rewriting his theory? I mean, this, is, this is a distinguished fellow in economics. He got velocity wrong, but he got a lot of other stuff right. Actually, um, I think all you have to do is read the first essay in Positive Economics. Because he said, in economics, we should find a way to settle our disputes. In other words, we let the empirical data speak to us. And in the time period in which Friedman was writing, velocity was stable. It's no longer stable. But I have a, a little bit better answer. And you may want to look this up. In June of 2003, just a few years before Friedman died, he did a luncheon interview with the Financial Times. And in this article, he acknowledged that the velocity of money was not stable. Now, there were some aspects of the interview that Friedman didn't like, and there was a big brouhaha and a lot of other articles. But for my satisfaction, he basically acknowledged that velocity had to be considered as a separate independent variable. Now, to settle this, I'm going to quote from Paul Volcker, who I believe, heads and above, was the greatest Federal Reserve chairman that we ever had. Now, Paul was a really, really good economist. He knew economics. And more importantly, and something that I've seen lacking in the leadership of the Federal Reserve for a long time, is that he had a great strategic view. He knew what was important. He was not little enmeshed in all of these little uh, statistics and the, minute, the, the minute bean counting that the Federal Reserve has become so well known for today. Paul could grasp the big picture. Now, another thing that you need to know about Paul is that he followed the monetary model. He made no bones about this. And if you don't believe me, I recommend you read his book called Keeping, Keeping at It. It was published in 2018. It's a great little book. Do yourself a favor and read it. Even if you don't agree with what he has to say, it's well written. It won't take you long. The subtitle of, of Keeping at It is even more indicative. He calls it The Quest for Sound Money and Good Government. The quest for sound money. Boy, you don't hear that mentioned anymore. But every time we abandon sound money, the burden falls not on Wall Street. Let me tell you, you know where it falls. It falls on those that are not able to protect themselves. Now, um, in Paul's book, in an earlier passage, he is well aware of Friedman's interview with the Financial Times. And he acknowledges that when he was chairman, he had the good fortune of dealing with stable velocity. And he also acknowledges that velocity is no longer stable. So keep that in mind as we read a couple of passages. First of all, he shows that he knows where the monetary model uh, uh, developed from from the work of David Hume, 1752. Wrote a paper called Of, Public, uh, of Money. He also wrote another short piece called Of Money. Of Money and Of Public Credit. And it, go on the internet and get both of them. Because David Hume was one of the greatest minds of mankind. He mentored Adam Smith, and Smith said that Hume was the greatest intellect of the Enlightenment. 
And in addition, it was, it was Hume, discussion of time and space, according to Einstein, was the inspiration for the theory of relativity. So Hume came up with the, fish, the equation of exchange. Fisher wrote it down. He also uh, reached the conclusion that when a state has mortgaged all of its future revenues, the state lapses into tranquility, languor, and impotence. The same thing that we're seeing by the overuse of debt today. So he knows where the monetary model comes from. He describes Friedman's model of inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon as being too simplistic. And we've supported it. Julia said that. I said it. I documented it. So then he comes to the critical point. And let's, let's read the passages from Paul Woker in his own words. Did I realize at the time how high interest rates might go before we could claim success? No. And here it comes. From today's vantage point, was there a better path? In other words, what, is he, he's, what he's saying is, was there a better approach than the monetary model? Even though the, we've got this complication the determination of velocity was not known to him. He says, was there a better path? No. From today's banner vantage point, was there a better path? Not to my knowledge. Not then or now. Thank you very much. That concludes my remarks. Just Let me get the bottle of water out. <laughs> Just barely made it. You had that figure uh, that showed uh, the trend growth in GDP and that it slowed down. Uh, real GDP mm -hmm. slowed down uh, quite substantially over the last 15 or, or 20 years. And, and you mentioned uh, Rogoff, Reinhardt's paper on uh, government debt. Do you yep. think there are other reasons that led to that slowdown and as well, what can we do to change and potentially increase the real growth? Rate? Well, actually, I have a list of about a dozen other papers that confirm Reinhardt and Rogoff. No, no, I and, 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 uh, yeah. uh, one of the best is by the two great Swedish economicians, Hendrickson and Berg. Hendrickson and Berg were educated at Yale, um, and they found that each 10 percentage point growth in total government expenditures as a percent of GDP reduces real per capita GDP across an extensive study by a half percent. Real government expenditures right now are around 36 percent, they're at an all-time high. And um, the, the, what, what this is indication is that, that we have the law of diminishing returns. That there is a time when debt is beneficial, but we long passed out of it. And I can show you other studies um, uh, that indicate that if you go back 50, 60 years ago, the government expenditure multiplier is positive. It never was the three or four that Keynes asserted. But it, it was close to one or maybe a little bit more. But it's turned negative, and we have multiple scholars that indicate that not only is the government expenditure multiplier negative, but it's going more negative. And that's the basic problem. In other words, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to put our fiscal house in order. And borrowing $10 trillion to get $2, two trillion of GDP doesn't get the job done. Great. Thank you very much. Next is Doug. Can you hear me? Yeah, cool. All right. Um, I'm going to take a different approach. Uh, and I guess the title is, I'm going to look back in time to hunt for parallels to where we are now and see if we can learn lessons from those past experiences to 
and I guess to be honest, to help us guess about where we're going. Um, so first thing we'll do, there were three high inflation periods in the 20th century. Um, they were different, but not that different. And I guess you can see from my second bullet point that I think what we learned from those experiences in the 20th century makes me think we have, in fact, uh, entered into the first high inflation period of the 21st century. Then I'm going to finish with one slide with a bunch of numbers on it that basically uh, makes one point. If you're a public markets investor, if you're investing in the equity market, if you're investing in the bond market, um, you don't want my view or Paul's view to be the right view. Right? Uh, stocks and bonds do well in a low inflation environment. It's very hard to get positive inflation adjusted returns uh, from public equities if we are in fact entering a high inflation environment. Okay, here's just a chart. Uh, consumer prices since uh, literally the beginning of the 20th century. We had three decades of very high inflation uh, in the 20th century, 1910s, 1940s, and the 1970s. I think from those three inflationary periods, I'd like to say we can come up with, uh, I guess what uh, Caldor called, uh, stylized facts uh, about inflation. Uh, each one of those decades had uh, really powerful catalysts. Um, all of them involved very significant supply disruptions. Uh, that, that, that sort of sparked uh, inflation. And then what we see after inflation uh, takes off in certain areas, uh, as uh, Paul described, relative prices. Some prices move a lot. Then you start getting conflict throughout the society, right? Uh, companies and industries that are seeing their cost of goods sold go up, they raise their prices to try to keep things even. Uh, as we're seeing real wages go down, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that we're seeing unionization efforts. Microsoft, Apple, I guess it makes more sense, Amazon, Starbucks. But they've, you know, workers at Microsoft and Apple are unionizing now says, wow, there, there's some serious struggle or, or conflict going on. Once we see price pressures broaden out, sort of it, it becomes what we're here to talk about now, widespread inflation, you get a, a policy response of some kind. What we saw in the 20th century is that policy response doesn't cure inflation. It sort of hits the pause button. It stops it for a little while. Where the real resolution to inflation comes is when we get structural change or, or structural adjustments. So I'm, um, I'm going to race a bit here because I, uh, I really want you to be able to ask us all some questions. So first uh, high inflationary period of the 20th century was in the 1910s. Um, some uncomfortable parallels to now. We had a high intensity war in Europe. We had a global pandemic. These two things occurring at the same time, uh, very much like we've just experienced. We had our existing trading patterns fractured. Uh, global supply chains broke down. And we really had quite a bit of global integration in the world at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and also important, human migration patterns sort of froze. So that really messed up supply as, as well. Um, and like we've just had, um, we had massive increases in government spending in the tens to support the war effort that like collided with supply constraints. And that's what got us going with inflation. 
you can see this is budget data uh, back then. Uh, there's no such thing as spending as a share of GDP because we didn't have well-established uh, gross domestic product data. So I just put in a number that's a pretty good guess. Uh, 60 billion was US GDP in 1917. So basically it meant we went from a government budget deficit of about 3% of GDP to 20 to 30% of GDP. Um, very little of it funded by taxes. So you know, massive increase in spending, that supported demand collided with a restrained supply network. Um, talked about this idea, uh, intense struggle between companies in different industries, between workers in different industries, and being at the University of Texas, I thought it might be appropriate to uh, use a, a, a metaphor um, think of being at a football game. Something really important is going to happen. People start standing up. It's not a big deal if I'm the one standing up. Paul and Lacey can keep sitting down. But if Paul and Lacey are in front of me and they stand up, not only do I have to stand up, I have to get up on the chair, right, to, to see. That's the way inflation in individual segments of the economy broadens out. Hey, I, want, I don't want my real wages to go down. I don't want my profit margins to go down. I'm going to raise prices, or I'm going to go on strike if that's what it takes to, to get a raise. What was the policy response? Well, I would argue the fiscal policy response wasn't really planned. It's just the war ended. So we had a 65% cut in federal government spending. Uh, Fed raised rates, in retrospect, pretty modestly from 4 to 7%. But the end result was enormous. The unemployment rate, when there was a draft, when the war was going on, was 1.8% in 1918. It rose to almost 12% in 1921. So a lot of old economics books refer to the depression of 1920, 21, uh, before we knew the 30s was on its way. You can see the sharp reduction in uh, government spending. We went from a 20% of GDP deficit to a surplus in one year. Uh, you can see what happened to the consumer price index. We went from almost 25% inflation to uh, a 15% deflation in literally in a matter of months. It, it was simply extraordinary. So that was the policy that paused or checked inflation. What solved it? What solved it was the Roaring Twenties, or what we came to call the Roaring Twenties. And I'd ask you to focus on this uh, thing labeled total factor of productivity, or, or in the jargon, uh, TFP. Um, I would argue that might be the most important statistic uh, created, and it really is created, uh, by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Uh, what it does is it tries to capture the increase in productivity that isn't accounted for by increased capital spending or increased hours work. Um, and you can see it was pretty high in the tens, 1.3%. It went up to two. That boosted overall uh, labor productivity. But I think the key is if you look at the capital import line, uh, unusually, we got this acceleration and productivity, even as the pace of growth of capital spending slowed. There was really and truly extraordinary innovation going on. Uh, one of those innovations, uh, Henry Ford, assembly lines, Model T, then Model A. You know, the people working on the factory floor could buy a car. That was really something new. 
And I, again, I argue this is probably, for me, the be-all and end-all of whether we are in a healthy or an unhealthy economy. Uh, it, it really is, I think, the idea of a secret sauce. And the reason it's so important, when we have very strong total factor productivity, it essentially turns the economy into a win-win game. It means that workers' real wages can go up, but corporate profit margins can stay very high. It, it's, you know, it is a dream come true from an economic standpoint. And if we're going to go back to our football analogy, uh, everyone can sit down, see the game, be happy. Uh, it, it's, it, it's a wonderful world. OK, um, 1940s, second high inflation period. Uh, didn't have a global pandemic, but we didn't need one to describe the world as a mess. Right? We, we had what we now call the, the Second World War, um, massive disruption of production, uh, also domestically, because we shifted so much production capacity to the war effort, stopped making cars, started making planes and, and tanks. And like during the First World War, we had a massive expansion of government spending to fund that. Uh, these, this data is in percent of GDP. Um, so we went from spending of about 10% of GDP uh, at its peak in the New Deal, uh, you know, 30s, uh, we went from about 10 to 24 to 42, 43. We had three years of government spending equaling 40% of, of GDP. So massive demand, supply constrained. We got a policy response, right? Because, you know, this conflict doesn't go away. Workers want to sustain real wages. Companies want to sustain profit margins. But we always make our policy based on the last event or, or last war. Uh, couldn't afford strikes. Couldn't afford you know, fiscal contraction, uh, not during the war. So we needed a new plan. What do we do? Well, what we did is we had price controls. Um, so important things, we got ration coupons, uh, prices were set, and, and sort of the way the narrative is written, uh, essentially Roosevelt used to go on the radio and say, you know, not all of us are uh, fighting a war uh, over there, but we are all fighting a war. So everyone home, you, you have a mission. If you go in a shop, and prices are higher than the published list of what they should be, you got to let us know. We're going to go find them. Because the goal of this was that real wages would stay the same, profit margins would stay the same, but you wouldn't you know, have any kinds of disruptions. Very different approach to stabilizing prices. And what we saw was a tremendous increase in the share of pre-tax income uh, going to the lower half of the income distribution. Uh, went from 14% in 1940, which is about where it was in the 30s, uh, up to 20% in, in 1944. Uh, essentially, American households spent no more than 75% of their income during the war. So when the war ended, the accumulations of saving was enormous. So when the US government cut spending after the war, we didn't have the kind of depression that we had uh, in the beginning of the 1920s. What did happen, though, is when price controls were taken off after the war, we got a spike in inflation in 47, 48. That quickly fell. And, and then you can see it, it dampening. And like we experienced in the roaring 20s, what we got in the 50s was Again, very strong, sustained, strong total factor productivity, very strong labor productivity. In the 50s, and this extended through most of the 60s, America again had 
if you will, a win-win uh, economic game going on. Real wages could go up, profit margins could stay high. Third inflationary period, 20th century. This one, very different. Um, some people refer to the US going off the gold standard as the equivalent of economic war because it was highly disruptive. Um, what was it? John Conley said, our uh, Treasury Secretary then, uh, the dollar is our currency and your problem. Um, and, and it was. It was a huge problem uh, for, for much of the world. And from an American standpoint, what it did is because if you were in the Middle East producing oil and you're getting paid in dollars and the dollar's collapsing, you're going to raise the price of oil. You're going to raise the price of, you know, all commodity producers wanted to raise the price to try to maintain their real incomes. I think a second factor in the 70s that I would argue is uh, less appreciated, but also very important, um, and this was triggered by a sequence of very highly publicized events, um, most notable around Cleveland, the uh, Cuyahoga River caught on fire. And uh, the river was on fire, and this was sort of the tipping point that Congress passed the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act. Why I think this was so important is it essentially required a massive wave of investment that didn't increase corporate America's ability to produce. We just had to, in effect, reproduce our existing production capability to maintain the status quo. Here's just a slide of um, dollar yen, 360 to 180, dollar Deutschmark. It's almost too good to be true. Exactly the same, but without uh, a couple of zeros. 3.6 to 1.8. So a dramatic devaluation of the dollar. Uh, again, we got all these struggles to, to try to maintain relative prices. And we didn't do price controls. We didn't have a massive fiscal contraction. All of the weight of pausing inflation fell on the Fed. A um, little bit fell on uh, a, a effort to sort of uh, dampen down the animal spirits of labor uh, when, when President Reagan made a very symbolic firing of uh, air traffic controllers. Uh, the end result of extraordinary increases in interest rates was the highest rate of unemployment since we saw in, in 1921. Uh, actually, in 1932, it was even higher. But 11% is not an inflation, uh, unemployment rate we want to live through. It, it's, it's, it's ugly. I think this chart might, it's really messy. The key point for me is the blue line is the Fed funds rate, the interest rate the Fed could control. The red line is nominal GDP growth. Um, you can see, even though the Federal Reserve was raising interest rates before Volcker took over in 79, the Fed didn't push interest rates in a sustained way above nominal GDP growth. Volcker did, and I think it's you know, notable how long they kept it there. Uh, what was it? We're lashed to the mast. <laughs> We're lashed to the mast. We're going to bring this thing down. Now, unfortunately, um, unlike the 20s, or the 50s, what we didn't get in the 80s was an acceleration of labor productivity or an, an acceleration of total factor productivity, um, despite very strong growth of capital inputs. So we got a lot of investment, but we got nothing overstatement, very little out of it in, in terms of, of productivity. I think if 
uh, we were as good at wordsmithing in the 80s as we are today, my guess is what was going on in the uh, 80s and early 90s is what today we're calling quiet quitting. Yeah, we'll go to work, but the way you're treating us, we're not going to give you any ideas on how we can improve productivity. Why would we do that? Um, so the US economy became a zero-sum game uh, in the 80s. And you, know, you can see it in, in what has now come to be known as the 1%. Uh, their share of pre-tax income rose from 11% in 79 to almost 20%, 17%, 20 years later, as you got a complete reversal of the income share of the lower half of the income distribution. It went from 20, where it went to in 1944, back down to where it was uh, at the end of the 1930s. Um, half of America got, on a relative basis, significantly poorer. And so this is just a, a chart of inflation. And I, I think while inflation fell down to something like two to three very quickly in the 20s, in the 50s, inflation didn't really fall even to two and a half on a sustained basis until we were uh, well into the 90s. Uh, and, and maybe an important thing for uh, two minutes from now is this sharp decline in inflation in the middle of the 80s, and even this one here, uh, both of those are associated with very sharp declines in crude oil prices. Uh, oil matters. So here we are now. Uh, we, unfortunately, again, have uh, a war in Europe that appears to be intensifying. Um, not de-escalating. Um, now it's tanks. Maybe in June it will be F-16s. I'm not a... Um, but it doesn't seem like it's going to end soon. Same thing is in the 40s and in the 10s. We've had a fracturing of global supply chains. Um, hit, confronted with very strong demand by a uh, big increase in budget deficits like we had then. Uh, not as extreme uh, as in the 40s, but, but pretty extreme. Uh, we went from about 20% of GDP in terms of government spending to 30% in 2021. 20 and you know, if you can believe CBO projections, sort of the fiscal tightening is behind us now. There's, there's not going to be fiscal tightening. It's, it's just pretty much a, a, a straight line. So like in the 80s, if inflation's going to slow down, it, it's going to be up to the Fed to do it. But there's something else, I, I think, at play here um, that not only echoes the 70s and the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, uh, I would argue it's, it's more profound. It, it's, it's climate change. Right? That it's, it's limiting investments in fossil fuels, which uh, probably isn't a great idea right now since we're going to keep using quite a bit of it. Uh, and it's also changing our, our physical world. Uh, just a huge amount of writing the beginning of the week uh, about the Colorado River and Lake Mead and we might be less than a couple of years away from Lake Mead being a, a dead pool and the water flowing over or through uh, the Hoover Dam might not be flowing anymore. And talk about a, a problem for American agriculture if uh, that's where California gets its water to grow what they grow. Um, so we got a root for snow. I know, you know, it wasn't a nice ice storm here. But if anyone's got a rain dance or a snow dance, um, we got to start doing it and, and, and share it. And uh, again, like we experienced in the 70s and 80s, uh, 
addressing climate change is going to require massive investment just to keep us where we are in terms of production capacity, let alone increasing uh, production capacity. Same deal. We've got these struggles going on. Companies want to protect their margins. Workers want to protect their real wages. Um, as I said, you know, the policy response, fiscal policy is done. We're, we're not going to tighten that. Um, the Fed is raising rates. The, the Fed is, um, I would argue, gently <laughs> reducing the size of its balance sheet. Um, I don't know what they were thinking when they promised to do 37 and a half uh, billion a month in mortgages. Uh, they're coming nowhere near that because no one's refinancing. And they've committed to not selling mortgages. They're only letting mortgages run off uh, when, when people roll them over. So they're, they're shrinking the balance sheet, but they're basically, so far this year, they've done about, I'm sorry, last year, they did about 75% of the amount of runoff that they promised. And here we are, um, sorry, this is old, now the current unemployment rate is 3.4. So um, I'm here um, slightly panicked to uh, disagree with, with, with Lacey, and I, I'd, I'd, say, um, I'd say the Fed has a ton more work to do, uh, a whole lot more work to do. Uh, remember the chart I showed about the 80s where Volcker's Fed pushed Fed funds rate above nominal GDP? Well, right now, nominal GDP, this is fourth quarter, is 7.3%. Fed funds rate is, uh, now it's 4.6%. And, uh, you know, early signs are consumer spending's doing okay. Um, I don't think the Fed's going to be able to stop raising rates at 5%. Uh, it's a guess, but I, I wouldn't put a lot of chips on they're almost done. Almost done. I, this is a paper. It's a new paper. It was published in December of 2022. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, out at UMass in Amherst. Uh, excellent title. Um, inflation in time of overlapping emergencies. What it is, is it's based on the input-output tables of the US economy. Uh, this is based on 71 industries that looks at whose outputs are someone else's inputs. It, it sort of looks at the totality of the economy. And the way they came up with the eight most important systemically significant prices is a blend of our direct consumption of the output, the indirect consumption, so the, the one, and they're ranked in order of importance. So the industry that was most important in inflation, and this is based on data from um, the year 2000, through the second <laughs> quarter of 2022. So just not in the last couple of years, it's the last 22 years. Uh, in order, you can see it. Now, I look at this list, I see that we're putting all the responsibility of taming inflation on the Federal Reserve, and I can see one of these eight that the Fed can actually influence, housing. Right? I don't know what they can do about petroleum or oil and gas extraction or farm prices or food prices or chemical prices since it's all based on petroleum. Um, utilities, you know, a lot of it's electricity. Increasingly, we're going to be focused on the price of water, I think. Uh, so we might end up having really weak economic activity in the United States and still have lots of inflation because inflation's coming at us from outside the country uh, rather than being generated inside the country. 
Sadly, and I, I, I know Julia highlighted that we got fresh productivity data um, yesterday. Um, it looked good. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you. Um, unfortunately, the prior 10 and a half years looked really bad. All right, so we got two good quarters uh, in, in, in the tank. And it's especially, look at total factor productivity. Again, a healthy economy, a healthy US economy was when that number was two or above two. Um, we've been below one on average for 22 years now. Um, why? Well, two ideas I have, and I, at the risk of offending some of you, um, what kind of economy-wide efficiency gains are we getting from the billions and billions of dollars going into cryptocurrency, <laughs> right? Lots of bucks producing nothing, nothing. Second one, and, and you know, I, I know finance theory says our capital markets are very efficient. Um, ha having worked in them for quite a while, <laughs> I, 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 I beg to differ. Um, I, I think another huge issue is the percentage of cash flow that corporate America is devoting to share buybacks rather than investing in new technology and efficiency. And I'd say the third factor uh, is quiet quitting. I, I mean, if, if, if you're a worker, and pardon my vulgarity, you feel like you're getting paid by shit, you might have a really good idea about how you can improve efficiency. Why share it? You're not gonna see it, you know? When we had a lot of productivity growth, CEOs were making 20 to 30 times what the average worker was. In the period on this chart, CEOs are making 350 to 400 times what the average worker does. Why share a good idea? You're, you're just not going to see it. Um, almost done. This is a log chart of civilian labor force. Um, I, I don't know if demographics means no inflation or lots of inflation. I know looking backward, it's meant not much. But right now, I think it, it, it means service sector workers are in a very strong bargaining position. Um, labor force isn't growing. And it's going to take a long time for the young people getting fired from Google to Apple to say, yeah, yeah, I'd love to uh, make salads at Chipotle. Um, it, it's, it, it's not going to be a rapid transition. Um, my last slide, um, this is a, an amazing data set that Robert Schiller uh, has posted on a website, um, updated all the time, free. Um, so average annual return is the first column in uh, nominal, EPS nominal, CPI, and then the S&P return adjusted for inflation. Um, 10s, 40s, 70s uh, weren't great times to uh, be uh, public equity investors. We've only got three years of uh, 2020s data. Um, so let's hope that essentially everything I've said is wrong and uh, inflation's going to be gone and stay gone. Um, but I, um, I don't think so. So I'll uh, stop there. Thank you. Wait a sec. Sorry. I'm not trying to run away. <laughs> Oh, yeah, good <laughs> Lord. The market agrees with her. Uh, she's <laughs> one of the markets are inefficient. So, uh, you know, being a capital markets experience, so how do we apply this? We've got a lot of young people in the room. Where do we go? Where do we invest? Well, um, I, 
I'm going to try to dodge, but I, I'll come back and answer. I, I, I think we should invest humbly. We should acknowledge that um, we are probably in a very, very, let's call it a profoundly different investment environment than we were in prior to 2020. Uh, how different it is, I don't think any of us can, with any sincerity, say exactly like this, 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 this. I, I would argue the only certainty, or the only thing I think is certain about the next three to five years is um, uncomfortably high volatility that we're, we're going to go to one side of the boat like we are right now, where the, yay, everything's great. And then we're just as likely three or four months from now to go to the other side of the boat and say it's sort of the end of the world as we know it. Um, and so I, I don't know if, if Paul's 30, 30, 30, 10 is right, but I think the idea of uh, more flexibility, um, hunting for uh, something new that might be uncorrelated because if, if we are in a world where inflation's, maybe it's gonna come down but then come roaring back, we could have more years like last year where you know, public equity markets and, um, and bond prices both fall uh, simultaneously. So I think the idea of um, educated uh, use of uh, volatility tools, uh, selling covered calls. If you think you want to buy something in a public market, maybe you might want to think about not buying it, but selling puts um, at a, a price where you'd like to own it. And uh, if it hits it, great, you'll take it. Uh, if, it, if it doesn't go down there, you make some money on the volatility. It, it's, I, I guess I tell my undergrads, um, there's this great quote from, I think it's Warren Buffett, that uh, derivatives are weapons of mass financial destruction. So I'm getting very nervous about suggesting, oh, you know, <laughs> you gotta trade options. Um, but you need somehow, I think, to have a volatility element uh, or a trading element um, because I, I just don't think you can, you know, buy an S&P index fund and, and buy the Barclays Ag and rebalance each quarter and be thrilled about what it's going to look like at the end of the year. It was such a nice environment when things worked that way, but I, um, I, I don't think that's the world we're going to live in for a while. When I think about where to invest, if I can also interject yeah. a little bit, <laughs> um, you know, observing and, and remembering what happened in the 70s, oil and gas companies grew to the point that they were about 30 to 35 percent of the market cap of the S&P for the peak in 1981. And then also you put your clock forward to when I was trading in the, in the 90s, technology peaked at about 40 percent of the S&P in 1999, 2000, and that NASDAQ peak. And then when you think about the housing crisis, and the, well, the predecessor to that, when banks were blown and going and everything, banking sector must have been around a third of the S&P as well. You know, I can picture in a time of inflation, it's just that's how markets develop. The smaller part kind of grows, and the mining sector, I think, could garner 30%, 40% of the S&P before this peak is put in place. So that liquidity will come and will grow from one sector, I would think. So it isn't all doom and gloom. It's just where you happen to be. Mm -hmm. Well, I think first off, if you look at consumption patterns, once you've gotten that first household in place, you know, basic shelter in place, 
it is still an actual old-fashioned consumer good. So it isn't maybe a Model T, but it is a microwave. It's, a, it's another TV. It is, once again, that uh, effect in both raw materials and goods before services, I, I would think. Services is the next leap. Yeah. <clears throat> So I'm not a big fan of the, this quiet quitting thesis. Um, what we've been seeing is uh, in this labor market, because so you know it was so strong, so fast, and the particularly the low wage segment is where the shortage of people is, and that was also exacerbated by the shutdown in immigration that happened during the pandemic. One of the um, pieces of information from this employment ro report this morning, they do this annual benchmark of population. Immigration flows have normalized. That's one of the reasons why we've seen wage growth not accelerate even though we've got you know, a 3.4% a unemployment rate. So that's really good news that actually we've turned that spigot back on. We've reprocessing work visas, uh, permanent immigrants. So that's actually a sort of pressure valve that comes at a pretty good time. Um, and the other thing in sort, of, in sort of longer term, I'm a little bit more optimistic than these guys on productivity in the near term and kind of the medium next few years um, for a few reasons. One, supply chain disruptions are a direct drag on productivity. That's gonna just be an inherent boost. You've got less downtime, less friction in the system, right? So you're gonna get a productivity boost off of that. The other is we've seen, because of this hot labor market, a lot of churn. We've got record turnover. Uh, the quit rate is really high. That, you know, in the near term is a drag on productivity. Over time, it's a boost to productivity because number one, people match to jobs that they're more happy with. Uh, and number two, you know, there's just a training period for anybody in any industry in any job of different lengths. So we know that that turnover is coming down as the labor market gets a little less tight. And so you're going to get people in their jobs for a little bit longer at, in a better match. That should be a tailwind to productivity. And the third thing is, because it's been such a tight labor market and such a long road to rehiring, what we're hearing from companies in, you know, we do a scraping of company reports, everything they're saying about their workforce, uh, that they, it was such a traumatizing event to try to restaff in this environment that they are, again, one, as I mentioned, investing in productivity enhancing, you know, labor saving business improvement projects. But also they're planning on holding onto their workers much more strategically through a soft patch in top line growth. So, that sort of bodes well for that kind of underlying resiliency. As a macroeconomist, I'm always thinking about the feedback loop. You know, a, a, an expansion is the feedback loop between hiring and spending. As long as people have jobs, they're gonna spend. And so it takes a whole lot to tip us into a negative feedback loop. Uh, so that just kind of gives a little bit of better underlying resiliency to the economy that these employer relationships may last a little bit longer than they did last cycle. Last cycle was the cycle of disposable labor. I mean, it was just, there was just, you know, uh, I think that's kind of what you're getting at with quiet quitting. I think we're going the other direction from that, where people are finding work that, you know, there's been a lot of existential crises during the pandemic. People are finding work that they want to do. Uh, they're making better matches, and they'll probably, we'll, we'll see a little bit better tenure and a little bit better uh, productivity. So I'm a little bit more optimistic than these guys on that because I think this high pressure recovery, everybody's incentives are aligned to do better, right? To, to, to you know, be more efficient, to invest better, to use your workforce more efficiently, to find the better match. Like everybody, like I see, I see the incentives. And you know, one, one good um, thing to keep in mind, and, I, and you mentioned Europe and the, and the war, the thing we often forget when we're thinking about the future is how um, you know, human ingenuity, people are pretty clever. So like we all thought this was gonna be a terrible winter for Europe. And yet it's a little warmer than usual, but also they, 
opened up some mothballed power plants. They resourced uh, natural gas supplies. They're ending up with an excess of natural gas this winter, uh, and prices are down. So we have more tools than those prior cycles through technology, through communication, through the global in networks we work in to solve problems. And we're incentivized to solve problems. So I don't know. I have a little bit more um, faith that we're going to react to incentives <laughs> in a positive way. And, and I, I think it's a great labor market. I, I just, I'm so happy for the Gen Zs because um, the millennials, and some of you in here, really got screwed. And, uh, and I think it's, I, I think a strong labor market challenges firms. Yeah, there's a labor shortage. So freaking run your business better. You know, I, I'm out there in the labor market hiring. I had to pay up to, to staff up this year. You know, good for them. You know, uh, I'll have to figure out how to make more money uh, to pay them. So that's good, right? That, that makes us a little bit more, you know, edgy and, and incentivized to do better. I think that's good. Great. <clears throat> well, I hope everybody uh, found this enlightening. I think it is four different opinions about how to look at the same issue. Um, thank you very much for your time.